done, including our friend on the panel right now, Mike of Stars Our Souls. The third topic, we looked at our favourite flat earth models, or the panellists' favourite flat earth models and why they prefer it. The fourth topic was shills and trolls. Not my suggestion, but I thought we got through it pretty well, and arguably it was very uncontroversial. I was looking forward to fireworks, but it didn't happen, maybe for the best. And now it's time to get into a general discussion section. The first thing I should say is that we've already gone well beyond two hours, so if any of you guys need to leave, just let me know in the side chat, and I'll give you a chance to say your goodbye. But if everybody's happy to stick around, I say we get into a general discussion, and basically the format is feel free to throw an idea out there or a question to another panel member. Everybody try and keep your answers concise and short so everyone gets a chance to have their say. And if we get bogged down on one topic, I'll move us on to the next one. But this is a chance now to air any thoughts or questions you might have for the panel members. Uh, give them a chance to respond. Try not to interrupt. And let's see what comes out of this. I know that the live chat has been looking forward to it. So we'll get the ball rolling. My co-panelists there, Matrix and David Weiss, have been very patient and very quiet. So I'll give them the first chance to uh, ask a question or, or feel a thought. Matrix Decode live from Spain via London. Floor's over to you. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, I'd just like to uh, state that um, my perspective, Roy Cooper, who's basically on the show, has emailed me and uh, you know he's saying he's unfortunately filming on site and he wish he could have been here today. So uh, just to get that out there. Um, yeah, I mean, this, uh, there's lots of questions. I guess we can ask the, the guests. Um, you know, for me, um, one of the things I wanted to bring up was the uh, the curvature maths formula that we've been doing, and you know, that's stated in Robo Samuel Roth Robotham's uh, Earth Not a Globe book, the eight inches times the miles squared formula. Uh, you know, I I made a mistake when I made uh, two videos uh, on this subject. Uh, my video across the sea here in Spain, filming a lighthouse, and I, I failed to subtract the uh, distance to the horizon, the height of the observer, so there's a midpoint that should be taken into account and subtracted. I've, I've since put up a new video with uh, the formulas uh, regarding this. Um, you know, also, that um, on Wikipedia, their, their distance to the horizon formula corroborates Samuel Robotham's eight inches times a mile squared, so that maps is pretty pretty solid. Uh, there are various uh, slightly very different formulas that come up with similar results, so I just wanted to get that out there so that people could, uh, if they're going to do this experiment, they should check it out and, and verify the geometry and maps, and it basically is Pythagorean theorem uh, and the distance of the horizon formula. Um, so I guess, I mean, um, I could put this question to Jeronism because uh, he, he's done a similar experiment and um, what are his thoughts on this? Sorry. Um, I think that, the, that the, the curvature, I guess the only thing that confuses me is if we take that eight times the miles times the miles, I guess I was always assuming that the that it would come out to 25,000 miles of curvature if you took the distance of 25,000 miles. So I guess uh, putting a question out to everybody because uh, it's just something I can't really wrap my head around. Why why does that number come out so big if the if the curvature equations are correct? And I'll do the math real quick for you. But eight times 25,000 miles times 25,000 miles. Divided by 12, divided Good by miles. 5280. Okay, so it comes out to 78,914 miles. I, I can so, answer that. Please, thank you. Um, well, as I understood it, it, you have to actually subtract the first mile. So um, of, of every, every calculation. So it's um, if you're talking about six miles, it's five time, uh, five squared times eight. Um, if you, I, I, I worked that one out because um, you look at Robotham's uh, original experiment. He said no, what my six, question was is if, okay, so the Earth is twenty five thousand miles in circumference, correct? Yeah. So that what based I, what on I, the heliocentric model, yeah. Correct. So my thought process this whole time was that if we were to ever take the eight times twenty five thousand times twenty five thousand, that that would come out to twenty five thousand miles of curvature. But when you do that equation, it comes out to 78,000 miles of curvature. So I want somebody to, exp I, I guess I just can't grasp. 
you know. I think I think that the issue, Jaronism, and I could be wrong about this, but you have to figure the point of curvature as the center of the Earth. The the point of curvature is not the surface level, if that makes any sense to you. Yeah, can, can, I, add, can I add something here? It's, it's, it's about the, uh, you know, you can only measure so far, say, a quarter of the circumference of the Earth, which is... Uh, 3,959 miles. Yeah, the, the three, yeah, 3,959 miles is the radius, but it's not exactly... The, it's, it's something like uh, 6,250 miles is a quarter of the circumference. So you, you can't see past that. And when you do apply the Bedford level map to 8 inches times a mile squared, it comes out to about 1,000 miles extra. So it's 4,900 miles or something like that more than the 3,959 miles. But I think at some point, you know, the curvature drop becomes so steep that you can't really measure it. But I've seen the various uh, mathematicians uh, demonstrate the geom geometry and the, uh, you know, the eight times the mile squared is, uh, is, seems, to be, seems to be correct. And they've applied various different, differing uh, measurements of how you interpret the observer, uh, the, not the observer height, the height to the horizon, the angle and so on, whether it's a vertical height or a diagonal and so on, and it all, all works out to 8 inches times a mile squared generally. But there is this thing, if you do try and calculate that to one quarter of the Earth's circumference, which is 6,250 miles for instance, that there is this uh, additional 1,000 miles. But when you do the Pythagorean form formula, bearing in mind the Earth's radius and adding a high and squaring it and all that and you apply that formula, it still turns out to be 8 inches times a mile squared. The point I wanted to make about this really is that uh, what, what Robotham does in his book and he details it, which you know was an oversight on my behalf when I made my two videos, is not to subtract, it, I mean he subtracts the observer height. So. For instance, uh, for, for instance, in my experiment across the beach at 7.71 miles, my camera height was two feet, approximately two feet above the water. So I would need to subtract 1.7 uh, miles off of the total distance. So that would leave me with six miles of curvature drop. That's based on my, you know, the height of the camera and the height of the observer. So when yeah. we're taking now these measurements, we should be doing that. But at, saying that at the same time, uh, I'm still seeing a serious lack of curvature and stuff that should not be visible. And another point is that you know this whole curvature mathematics is really a theory based on the Earth being a sphere, which it, it appears not to be. And the, the official Wikipedia distance to the horizon matches up with Ray Botham's formula. But when we look across the sea, we can, uh, from my height of two feet, I can see much further, the horizon is much further than 1.7 miles. It's almost all the way across the 7.71 miles. So uh, when people are doing this experiment, they should bear this in mind. Uh, but I think the whole curvature mass, the, cur the sphere itself is pure theory and is not observable. Yeah, and, that, and that's absolutely right. Where you where you figure the one mile subtraction from the distance is at six feet above sea level because that's going to be the distance from your eye to the apparent horizon. So you have to subtract that. But what what I think he built into that equation was the fact that objects that are perpendicular to the horizon and travel beyond that drop off point are going to begin to angle away from you, which will make their apparent height to you if you're standing on the opposite edge of that curve a lot shorter than it would be if it was indeed, perpular, uh, indeed perpendicular to your apparent horizon. Because again, the center of curvature or the point of curvature is at the center of the Earth. So if, if that does make sense to why the um, Geronism, your calculation might not come out flush with 25,000 miles. Okay, Making thanks. Sense? Yeah, cool, cool. Uh, and, and, you know, anyone else want to make, chime in on that, or should we move to another? Yeah, I, I have, I have a. Um, it's it's kind of related to the to the curvature of the Earth. It's the horizon. Um, one of the one of the last videos I made, I called it "Why Does the Sun Set on Earth?" And it should have been, I should have named it one of the reasons that the sun sets on Earth. And what I what I want to talk about is. 
the horizon and the vanishing point. They're two different things. So when you look into the distance, you know, it's when the sky meets the land. Well, the sky is smooth and comes down and, and eventually gets to a vanishing point, but the earth has mountains, trees, cars, waves, swells, whatever you want, and it creates a what I call a false horizon before the vanishing point from your perspective. So no matter what you're looking at, no matter what surface you're looking over, there's a false horizon. And as anything in the air travels along away from you, as we all know, due to perspective, it, it looks like it's dropping down, and it goes behind that false horizon before it gets to the vanishing point. So if you're out in the middle of the ocean and it's amazingly calm, perfectly calm, there are swells. I mean, just from you know going to the next town over 10 miles away, high tide is 20 minutes later than uh, high tide is where I, where I am, just a short drive away. So there, there are swells and that creates a false horizon. And that's, what, uh, that's how the sun looks like it goes behind things. Um, when it's moving away. So, anyone want to chime in on that? Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, yeah, a lot. One of the things I hear a lot is, um, you know, the the way that the sun apparently behaves in the sky sort of shows that we live on a ball, or you know, shows that the Earth isn't flat. But you know, it, it all has to do with perspective and the sun traveling on a different plane. Um, one of the things that Robotham indeed proved very clearly was that the sort of accepted law of perspective in terms of, you know, all parallel lines form, you know, converging at the same point is sort of misguided because the further asunder a parallel line is from your point of view, the longer it's going to take to, or the, the further more distant point it's going to converge at. So I, I guess what he was describing was that, you know, very clearly that the top of a ship is going to sort of decline towards the horizon at a slower rate than the hull of the ship because the hull of the ships is in your direct line of sight while the top of the mast is further asunder from your point of view. So um, when you look at the sun in terms of these laws, with it being so large, I mean, 30 to 35 miles in diameter is huge. I mean, we can't even comprehend something that large on Earth because it would go from horizon to horizon. You couldn't even take in the whole thing unless it's at such distances. So it is a very large object, but it's it's uh, traveling on a plane that is so far asunder from your point of view that it's going to decline towards a different point than stuff, say, like a hot air balloon that you see you know, traveling away from you in the sky. It, it behaves differently than objects that we can relate to. Um, and so that's sort of been one of the ways that uh, people sort of assumed that we live on a globe we, because of the behavior of the sun, which is actually, you know, adhering to the contrary doctrine of uh, perspective or true perspective, not artistic laws of perspective, which have been, you know, disproved. So. Yeah, I have a different view, slightly different view, um, of that, David, um, and it's, uh, it's kind of similar to uh, more girls. Um, we know that clouds are literally lay a certain height above the ground, and um, the sun is obviously a lot a lot higher than that. So you can you do have a situation where the clouds go beyond your vanishing point, um, but when the sun gets gets to the point where the clouds start to obscure them. Yeah, we don't see the clouds. We just see the fact that uh, the sun is obscured by by something that we can't see. So it gets taken for the horizon. I don't know if I. Um, yeah. No, no. That way. that's that is definitely uh, part of my thinking process there. Especially when we look at all those high altitude high altitude balloon videos, it looks like the Earth is always covered with with clouds um, somewhere. Just last night, I was watching the sun set. Um, it wasn't down, and across the sky, you know, the opposite direction, the sky was already very dark, and I could still see the sun. So it, it's interesting that, that that light wasn't lighting up, uh, you know, the eastern side of my view, and it got dark even before the sun got over past the horizon slash vanishing point. That's a good observation. Yeah. 
Uh, trust my old friend David Weiss's topic to kill the atmosphere. We're going to move on to my friend Wakey. Wakey, I know you've got a question you want to throw to Mark Sargent, so the floor is yours. Hi, Mark. Uh, it's good to finally be in the same sort of room, virtual room. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, I like your work. Uh, you said in a podcast a couple of months ago that a cataclysmic flood made a lot more sense on a flat Earth. This is something I very much agree with. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what your thoughts were on a cyclic cataclysm occurring within the enclosed dome model and if you knew of the dark rift and Tunguska work I've been doing and what your thoughts were upon that. Um, I hadn't, I, I have, I've been watching a lot of stuff. Unfortunately, I didn't catch your dark rift and Tung Tunguska thing recently, but I will after this is over to be sure. As far as a, a cyclic or a cyclic um, a, a pattern of how this system gets reset, for lack of a better word, or altered, uh, I absolutely believe in it. Uh, I, I've stated several yeah, times too. that uh, that we're obviously not the first tenants to rent this apartment. How it comes about, I'm I'm sure you know, and I don't want to steal too much from the Matrix. Where, where you know, they kind of hinted that you know the, this is the fifth or sixth time we've destroyed Zion, that sort of thing. But it does feel like that sometimes, doesn't it? You know, how many how many cities can we find underwater? How many uh, pockets of weird uh, um, ruins can we find underground with weird circumstances around it, like you know the uh, the radioactive glass in India, uh, you know. Or, or continents and how they seem, you know, did we start out, was version 1.0 uh, a Pangaea continent where, you know, were the early versions much more simple than what we have now? And then they finally figured out how to, how to get things just right, where they spread them out a certain way or, you know, they shifted the water around, you know, are we, you know, living on a really, a, a really complex version of an Etch-a-Sketch? Um, but yeah, yeah, I absolutely I, believe in, in the multiple cat cataclysms theory. Yeah, me too. It does seem that around 12,000 BC there was a huge cataclysm. And if we're talking in closed dome, we sort of got to look at this very differently. Some, some of my recent work has been looking at Velikovsky's work and myths all around the world with the Aborigines and the Maya and the Aztec and yeah. looking at these myths of the stars and the sun with new eyes. And I was just thinking this might be something... I'll be talking to you about in the near future because I've seen you've done some work upon this. Yeah, yeah, I, it's it's so strange watching it because it feels like you know looking at, at legends of you know the Mayas and the Incans and the um, uh, different cultures around the world that it's it's a different cataclysm every time. You know, yeah, everyone knows about the Great Flood, but I don't think we've heard about multiple Great Floods. You know, you know, it's like what was that line from the uh, uh, from the Christian Bible, where the promise, uh, yeah, the, that was it, wasn't it? The the rainbow promise that uh, you wouldn't, that water would only would never be used again. <laughs> I thought, I go, yeah. well, that's an that's an interesting out. So what are you going to use this time? Ice, yeah. fire. Yeah, some of the myths throw. say some of the myths say the next one's fire, but it could be that it's always fire. But some people witness it as water. Like most of the population would witness it as water, as in a tsunami. Yeah. So it's hard to know if the cyclic cataclysm is using a different element or not. I yeah. presume so, yes, but we can't rule out that it's always something like fire yeah. and that to most people recording this who survive, they record it as what they see, i.e. water would be the most recorded, witnessed experience. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Well, yeah, and I think species survive through through the water part of it, uh, not, not to get off on a tangent, but uh, the uh, you know little little things like prehistoric fish that have been around, you know that you know of course they would survive something like a water cataclysm, uh, but that throws a big monk uh, wrench in the in the science world, which is okay if this fish is supposed to have been dead what 100 million we'll just round down to 100 million years ago, then why is it still there? Because 100 million years is a long long time. And, yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah, it does seem that the flat Earth. Subject is starting to very much kill Darwinism, isn't it? It's very much. Oh yeah, Darwinism. and and most most likely the carbon dating system as well. Uh, carbon dating has always been in question. Uh, not to go off on the on the Kent uh, Hovind thing, but uh, you know where he was saying, oh yeah, we've carbon dated living animals at, at certain thousands of years. 
So yeah, yeah. There's going to be yeah. a lot of things that'll that'll change if this. Yeah, happens. because people just point to NASA in the flat Earth world. Say, oh, NASA, NASA, NASA. But I've got big questions about the geology people in the mainstream, the historian people in the mainstream, the people looking at the ancient myths in the mainstream. I believe all these people are like another NASA. It's not just oh. NASA covering the curtain, putting the putting the cloth over the table. We've got we've got the National History Channel. But all these geologists, it's not just NASA. Oh, so yeah, yeah. Within the flat of community, I'd like to see more people looking into this other realms as opposed to just NASA, because you, geology got, got big questions over. Sorry, Mark. Yeah, you've, you've you've got a great point there, and that is, yeah, I throw NASA under the bus a lot because they're such an easy target to pick, and they're so high profile. But you know, I've I've stated several times now that the, the the physical sciences, you know, aside from astrophysics and astronomy, which will have to be destroyed. Uh, you know, you're just you know burned down and rebuilt. But l look at all the other physical sciences. What you were talking, you know, geology, uh, geography, hydrology, archaeology, any of those things. They'll have to be retooled so severely, and then you know you're gonna you have to wonder, okay, how many of these guys may have known something? And uh, yeah, it's an, it's gonna be a weird, exciting time. Can't wait. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for answering. Yeah. No. No worries at all, man. Well, I know uh, that we've got more questions. Uh, stars our souls, mate. Over to you. Okay. Um, a couple things I want to ask and add. Um, I want to ask Mark Sargent. Um, and this has just been perplexing me. That why do you put your phone number on your videos, which you cut your comment by? And no, and I'm not accusing you of anything because math does the same thing. I'm yeah. just wondering why do don't you get calls three in the morning? like some round earther calling you and you're trying to sleep and he's calling you, hounding you about, you know, some flat earth stuff. Like, do you cut your phone off? How does that work? <laughs> okay, two-part two part question. I'll, I'll be quick. Um, I put the phone number there initially because I wanted to make this as legitimate as possible. Just, just because I'd, I'd seen enough stuff on YouTube where people get accused of, of a lot of things, and a lot of it is because you know people remain anonymous. But I thought, okay, you know, and I really, honest to God, I never thought this was going to get as much traction as as it did. So I put my phone number, my real email address, but I, I turned off the comments mostly because of what was going on at the actual Flat Earth Society, not not Eric's group, the International uh, Flat Earth Research Society, because that hadn't even really existed yet. But they were they were they were dedicated trolls at the Flat Earth Society who were just beating on people constantly, just relentless. I mean, you know, these guys had like five, six thousand posts each. Jaredism, I think, looked through it, he could attest to it. And so but and by the way, eventually you guys probably may or may not see it. I finally turned on comments on all my videos simultaneously. Uh, you know, once once I hit a certain level, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna send it out there and, and see if they come. But to answer your other question, do people call me? No, because trolling generally is anonymous. That's one of the rules of trolling. That's how this whole trolling thing started. Is you make an alias for yourself. You don't have to give them your real name, and then you can just say whatever you want about people and just light them up. But if you're gonna troll somebody personally. You, you can't, you know, nobody's going to create a separate fake phone number, you know, or an alias phone number just to call me. Uh, and it, and even emails. You would have think that people, you know, because you can create a fake uh, uh, Hotmail account or whatever you want and, and email me. I've gotten very, very few, maybe just less than 10 uh, hate mails. But nobody has called me, ever called me up in the middle of the night. Yeah, I mean, I get some drunk guys. But they're not necessarily round earthers. They're just drunk. You know, they'll, they'll call up and say, yeah, 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 you know, and then hang up. But I, I've learned to pretty much shut off the phone as soon as I go to bed. So. Well, well put, well put. Now I understand because, uh, yeah, it would make sense. Nobody will call you uh, unless they block their number. But then yeah. you can still trace. You can still trace them back. So yeah, that exactly. makes sense. Yeah, um, troll, tr trolls are, n are notoriously lazy. So. Right, right. Okay. Um. Great question. Great answer. Now, uh, who was my? Now, see. Now I know I'm going getting old because I'm losing my damn uh, memory. I had another question and I totally forgot what it was. So give me a second. That, that's okay. <laughs> uh, about um, about how I answer stuff. No, no, no. It had nothing to do with you. Um, oh, it okay. actually had something to do with like just the science. But I oh, totally okay. forgot what the question was. <laughs> well, Stars, while you're thinking of that, 
Uh, Mark deserved a chance to ask somebody a question. Mark, is there any topic that you wanted to get out there to get the panel's thoughts on? Um, well, I just wanted to throw this out. There's so many people. I mean, yeah, everybody in this panel does great stuff. And you got to remember, it's such a great group effort that every day, literally every day, I go onto YouTube and I, I set the filter. You know, I type in flat earth. And for those of you who are, fine, who are just listening to this or thinking of making their own videos, make sure you put flat earth in the title if you can because that's what draws all the attention. But there's so many people coming out every day that who knows who's going to be the, you know, the, the who's going to be on this panel the next time you decide to do this. I mean, I was just looking at um, uh, Jeffrey Grupp's work, who I think currently is the hardest working guy uh, in the game. Uh, he's got, you know, a lot of academic background, and he came out of conspiracy retirement because of this topic, and he's making some wonderful stuff. I, I sent a thing to uh, uh, down the rabbit hole just recently. He did a thing called the Dome Sky Ceiling and the Zetetic Eye, where he was basically saying, look, here's why the sun does what it does and the moon does what it does. It has to do with uh, the, the curvature of the structure we're in. And, you know, he just does, you know, there's just so many neat people out there. I just want people to make sure they're, they're, they're looking at everybody. Uh, Mark, that's and, the that's the video that you sent me that uh, totally flipped my world upside down. Yeah. And I fell off because there's no gravity. Yeah, every time he calls me, I I just hold my breath because I'm like because he says, "Oh yeah, I've gotten three hours of sleep in the last ten days. I can't, you know." It's like he's working in some little secret laboratory where he's just concentrating everything. He throws everything at it, and the two videos that he's put out, um, the other one was called. Uh, uh, the Chicago skyline, light refraction and the illusion of curvature, where he breaks down. He's going, look, he's going, there, there is no curvature. Anybody that tells you that BS about the ship going to the horizon, I can show you why that's not true. I mean, yeah, the, the videos are a little longer. They're usually over an hour, but they're totally worth it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, yeah, well, I, watched, I, I watched that one also. One thing, just you mentioned that this is a group effort and everybody has their different styles and you can wake with with this group effort. We're waking up the most amount of people. Those those videos that you sent me, they're an hour and a half, two hours long. Lots yeah. of people that don't believe in the flat Earth will not take that amount of time. So yeah, I, know. I got I got a copyright <laughs> strike, but Jonathan did the Morgyle, um a while ago, and it limited me to fifteen minutes. So I started making short videos, and now <laughs> I, I I flip out if my videos go over three minutes because a one or two or three minute video will get somebody, wake them up, so they'll go watch Flat Earth Clues. So they'll go yeah. watch a longer video. And so, so Jonathan, you're now, you have to make short clips. You know, somebody might watch one of your clips of that book you read and be like, oh, let me see the next one. But if it was a six-hour video, they wouldn't watch it. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's a lot easier to, uh, well, obviously, to, uh, to lay them out and render them for, for sure. Um, you know, I can render a 15-minute video usually within 30 minutes, but, uh, you know, when it gets over an hour, hour and a half, it's just a real pain. So I, I, I rather enjoy making the short ones, and I think it's sort of a blessing in disguise, you know, because um, I, I tend to be not so brief, you know. So uh, it it is sort of a challenge to try to compress the points I want to make into a, a shorter um, time span, and, and I, I think you're right. I think it does uh, it makes it a little bit more bite sized, a little bit easier for people to digest. And uh, yeah, um, jumping back to a couple points that I wanted to touch on uh, that were mentioned earlier, and I didn't um, didn't get a chance to or didn't think to, but uh, John Lebon mentioned the whole the whole peanut gallery story, and I think you know funnily enough that I just, I too tend to question just about everything anymore, um, in terms of you know an anecdotal stories of how phrases were coined, even even such trite or trivial uh, things such as that. I'm really second guessing every explanation, which is uh, as far as I can tell, is an excellent point of view um, to maintain in any scientific study. Um, one final point on the shills, uh, the way I like to put it is I really never been a big fan of baseball. Um, I guess you could say I, I don't like watching baseball. I wouldn't go so far as to say that I hate it, but let's just say that I really hate baseball. Um, I just don't see myself spending 24 hours a day going to websites or forums where people discuss baseball and just calling them stupid all, you know, all the time, seven days a week. So, yeah, there is definitely something to that, but uh, NASA fakery was another point that was mentioned a couple of times and I think that's a real important one to go on and, and in fact I've been looking at the 
the fakery with NASA for a couple of years. Um, just never, never connected it to this whole other world, I guess you could say, until right, I guess you could say the middle of April of this year. So, um, and, and I, I also feel that regardless of what we all decide or not, but whatever we decide individually to be the most viable model may have no real bearing or validity in terms of reality, um, as we really just don't have enough uh, freedom or evidence beyond the southern regions to point to, other than, um, you know, the, the mariners in the 1800s were sort of putting two and two together and finding out that the distance between known points in the southern hemisphere uh, sort of added up to a much larger uh, circumference than could be attributed to a similar, you know, region to the northern hemisphere. So they sort of were on the brink of proving, you, you know, geologically that the globe model was wrong and fast forward 50 or 100 years and that's, you know, where you start seeing the Operation High Jump, Fishbowl, and the whole Antarctic Treaty coming into, into life. So um, NASA was sort of an offshoot of that, I think. Yeah, um, uh, let me let me just add to that because um I I'm about to run I gotta go but I do want to say that um uh, uh you guys were right it's not just NASA it is also other agencies such as you know uh, somebody mentioned Ken Hovind and I just want to say that um a lot of that is get, is dehumanizing um there's a lot of racial elements when you're talking about evolution. And um, I can I did a whole video on that, so you guys could go check that out. But what I want to do say is uh, I do want to apologize to Moore Guile um, for my passionate um, dissertation I gave earlier, which was a little bit over the top. I shouldn't. Uh, you you got to understand this. There's I was smeared in public, and I had to nudge him back. That's all that was. That's all that no, was. Just like two people play tough, man. I just it's had to good, get nudge back because you know when I'm smeared, I can't let you slide with it, man. So yeah, no, man, I, I, you know, to be to be honest with you, man, I, I've I've watched a lot of your stuff and I've really enjoyed your stuff and I've put positive comments on your on your work. So well, I'm I, not sure where that came from. I, but. No, it, no, no. It had like I said, it wasn't personal because I don't know you. It it had something to do with him. Do you you see what I'm saying? So no, you're, you're good, man. Do with you. good. And I and I love you guys. I want to do you know apologies, respect, love you guys. I gotta run though. So um, it was. I do deeply appreciate the uh, offer to come on your show, and I hope you guys have me back. And uh, Mark, hey, keep me in mind for a show, man. I mean, I'll try to be civil. Uh, you know, just keep me in mind. All right. T totally, man. All right, I'm out, guys. Peace. Yeah. Later, man. Uh, one one further point that I was going to make is uh, somebody had mentioned in the comments that the Great Flood would not be possible on an infinite infinite plane. Um, I would say, contrarily, if you look at the um, the model that I've sort of described in one of my most more recent videos, it's under 15 minutes. It's uh, flat Earth and the firmament. Um, the, the model that I subscribe to very much could be flooded, but I would retort to that um, the opposite way. Um, a, a recession of those waters would be impossible on an enclosed system. So, you, you know, I believe that since the world is not covered by all that water anymore, um, it proves, you know, at least in a biblical sense, that the temporary flood possibly caused by the firmament or ice, which previously covered the face of our Earth, um, which ice separated the water from the water above, and finally flooded all over the world's oceans, and that's confirmed in all ancient cultures, and uh, this could also explain an instant drop in pressure uh, when that firmament of ice was destroyed, causing the flood, uh, instantly released all of the pressure that would have been contained uh, in a much warmer and a much more oxygen-rich atmosphere that was apparently in existence back then. It would cause all of that uh, atmosphere to expand outwards, which could explain uh, you know, the herds of well-preserved animals found with tropical berries in their mouth pointing to an instant flash freeze and st staying totally in alignment with the scripture found in Genesis. Um, and then finally that, a point... That can't be true because uh, some animals were found a long way away from where they should have been. So there was guaranteed to have been a big tsunami. They found woolly mam mammoths at other places, like smashed against a cliff. So I don't think it was an instant freeze because many animals were found like hundreds if not thousands of miles away from their natural habitat. Sure. Yeah, anything's possible. Think, you know, the uh, plates can migrate, so I'm not arguing with that. But I, I guess what my point is is um, anything's possible, 
and um, we, we need to sort of consider all accounts and, and each and every one of us will have the final or you know most definite as far as we can reckon conclusion that we can draw but you know what I conclude or, or what I believe may be different than than what you believe and, and that's fine I think it's healthy to have such disagreements um, and and ultimately you know again it always falls back to that Antarctic Treaty um, the, the final point I wanted to make, and I don't want to take up too much of everyone else's time, but um, it, it is true Mark Sargent mentioned about the title of videos. Um, I've made a few important vids on the topic that are in my series that just don't have flat earth in the name of the video, and they still tend to get substantially less views than the other ones with such a, you know, quote, working title. So there is uh, definitely, definitely truth to that. Jaronism, would you like to jump in? No, I mean, I don't have any questions for anybody. If anybody has a question for me or... I have a question for you. You mentioned, uh, and I think I said it earlier, that um, you wanted to comment on Red's, Red's uh, rhetoric's uh, mathematical equations and how um, they're easily disproved. Is that something you want to talk about or you want to move on? Sure. No, we can talk about that. I mean, yeah. it's not so much that they're easily disproved. I think that they're easily proved. And that's the difference. That's what's easy about math is that um, you can prove anything mathematically and it doesn't mean that it meets your reality. And that's where I think that there's a disconnect between those of us who can uh, grasp the difference between mathematics and science and those that can't. And this has clearly been set up you know, for hundreds of years to where... Um, this is kind of a plan, and even if you go back and read a lot of what Einstein had to say about mathematics, um, he saw the potential for a lot of problems um, in the whole concept of mathematics having axioms, because in order to have these equations like you guys talked about earlier with the constants, a lot of mathematics comes from um, basically having an axiom. and when you've accepted certain things as being true, for instance, the stars being infinite miles away or the suns being infinite miles away, well then it's really easy to draw up a lot of mathematical equations. So I get hit up a lot of times from people saying, why are you avoiding any kind of a debate with uh, Red's rhetoric? And to me it's just clear that what, you're, what I'm setting myself up for is simply him to read math and it is proven. It's not like as if his math won't be able to be proven. Now, like what you guys were saying to him when you guys were challenging where did they get some of these numbers, well, that's one of the things where they're just going to be able to talk you in circles. Uh, you guys did a good job of frustrating them, um, but really to their little cronies on their channels and stuff, it's going to look to, to everyone like they have uh, won that debate um, because they schooled you in mathematics. And I don't think people understand enough that Sometimes math just isn't um, capable of describing reality. And, the, the, in fact, I, I think a big belief, have you guys heard the whole theory that the whole universe is mathematics? You've probably right. heard that before. Yeah. yeah. And that's, it's just not true. It's, it's simply mathematics is a, is a human construct. It's, uh, you know, the whole idea of having 10 as a two-digit number and those things, those things are all, are all created by man. Um, so, can I interject really quickly? I do apologize, sure. mate. Can you guys see my screen here? Yeah, oh, yeah, we're, we're looking at it. Yep. yep. Yeah. This is what this is one of the screen shares from uh, uh, one of the slides from uh, Red's Radio screen share from last week. Now, further to what journalism was saying, and I mentioned this earlier in the show, mathematics is a tool, and you can use this tool for many different purposes. Now, here. I would argue that much of this mathematics checks out. You can sit down and do it by yourself. And a lot of this is actually very straightforward mathematics, very straightforward trigonometry. Mm -hmm. The issue here is the assumption. Now, for this particular equation, the assumption is a baseline of 1.3 times 10 to the 4 kilometers, right? Which, even when I read that out, that might sound fancy. But where's that baseline from? That's from the diameter of the Earth. Now, if we're trying to establish whether or not we live on a ball, to assume the diameter of the Earth like that, is to assume the thing that you're trying to find. So I asked them, right. okay, let's go with your mathematics, no issues. The assumptions that you put into your formulas, where did that baseline come from? Now, if people want to hear that um, conversation that took place from that point, again, just go back to episode 11 from last week. But I will uh, paraphrase what took place. They said, well, uh, we took that baseline measurement of the dome of the Earth, but you don't need that to, to do these equations. 
you can find that yourself doing your own observations and then comparing the distances between those observations uh, and then and doing the maths like that. And I said, okay then, so where did your uh, observations come from? And the context here is that if you can find parallax of Venus as it passes in between the Earth and the Sun, the, the idea is that if you can find that angle and then the distance between the two observations, you can do the mathematics. And in theory, that checks out. But I asked them, where, if you, okay, if we're not taking the diameter that you're just uh, assuming, where did you get your uh, observations and your distances from? And they said, well, there's a guy on YouTube, his name is Thunderfoot, and he did it, and I did it, and we know the distance between us, between me and Thunderfoot. And I said, okay, then, so how do you know the distance between you and Thunderfoot? Oh, Google Maps. Oh, okay, so you're going to tell me that you know how far away the sun is based on trigonometry using Google Maps. And he said, and he could see how absurd that sounds, so he said, oh, well, actually, we don't even need Google Maps. Um, well, we, there's a bunch of us, there's a community of us who, who do it, and we know the distance between each other. And I said, how do you know the distance? And he said, well, we can drive it. We can just use the odometer of our car. Now, this, this isn't me putting words in his mouth. This is him openly stating live on the air that he believes that using these equations, and the equations check out, in, in my opinion, he believes that the assumption, <laughs> that the, the, um, the distances that you put in into this formula that you can discover by using the odometer of your car. Now, my point has always been, let them explain their system. Let them explain where they're getting their measurements from and let the listeners make up their own mind. If a listener says, you know what, right. um, I don't mind that they're using the odometer of their car to tell me how far away the sun is and then they're using the distance of the sun to the earth to tell us how fast the earth is moving and, and all the rest. I don't mind that. I'm fine with that. I say, okay, that's, that's up to you. Me personally, that doesn't strike me as anywhere near scientific. That strikes me as absurd. And this is just one of the assumptions that they use. I can go through slide by slide and point out more and more and more. The, the entire, just... the, yeah, the entire construct is made the exact same way. I mean, if you look back at that last image you had up, um, I really think you can just look at it as being in, in another language. It can be in Spanish. And there's, there's no way that any of us can sit there and say, well, that's not true because maybe we don't speak that language. But that language to people who speak Spanish, it's describing where they live to them, and if they want to accept it, they can accept it. I choose not to accept mathematical equations until I know that those equations have been proven in my reality, meaning if you're going to show me division to show me how much uh, each person should get if we split $10, well, I know that in my life I've done enough math with money that I trust your division equation. But I don't trust equations that have constants and have um, sine and, and have these, these crazy things that uh, a mathematician can, can create out of thin air. And that's what you know, math really is. It's, it's trying to depict reality with, on paper. And I mean, to me, it's just absurd. Uh, we've never, and I know NASA says they have, but until you've been to Mercury or Venus, how are we able to know that that is a physical item to where we can measure the distance to it. For instance, what if it's on a TV screen where if you're looking at a TV screen of an image on a screen, well, you can't measure that distance because to you it's right in front of your face. But it might be in the TV movie, it might be 40 miles of space between that item and what the perception is supposed to be. So I just think it's insane that we're um, almost uh, required to follow their rules of life and it's not, it's just something that, you know, I woke up one morning, uh, you know, this year, probably early January, where I just said, I'm not doing it anymore. They can take their gravity and shove it because it does not make sense to me. They can, and all they do is talk in circles, and especially that guy, um, it's constant uh, demeaning remarks. He likes to throw them in kind of under the carpet. Um, you guys saw it. I, I listened to the show. It made me sick that you even had to deal with him because I've already had to deal with it, and it's, it's, it's frustrating, but I thought you guys did a great job. So, um, so Jaron, uh, you know, he says he measured it in his car. You know, that would be a car that's driving on a road that's perfectly straight between two points, which doesn't exist. Right. So, one that that's a lie. But even if he did that, wouldn't their parallax equation work on a flat Earth? Two different points, looking at an object in the distance, Absolutely. whether it's curved or not, it would it would still come up with uh, a workable equation. Well, now they had to. Now he just gave these degrees. Where did he get these degrees from? For instance, right. how does he? How do you figure right. out the angles? Um, 
this is something that my wife and I, when I was kind of thinking of this whole triangulation and Pythagorean theorem, I said, let's let's measure the moon. Well, when we got outside and looked up, I mean, I said, how the hell do we measure angles? Like, I know how to measure a degree by putting my fist out, and I know that my fist is about five degrees each way I go up, but it's not it's not perfect. It's going to be, it's, it's just, so then I kind of realized math is just, it's, it's conjecture. It's based on faulty well, premises. What it, what it is, the, the reason that they get the nonsensical number, for example, for the sun being 93 million miles away is, be, you know, the default correct answer to this equation is just using simple Pythag you know, Pythagorean theorem where you can calculate by, you know, measuring the angle of the shadow cast by the sun at high noon on multiple points on the same meridian with, you know, specific many miles in between each point, the default answer is always less than 4,000 miles to the sun. But in adding a layer of, comp you know, complexity into the equation and assuming that we live on the a curvature. sphere... Right, that's where you get the nonsensical huge discrepancy from the truth is because of that assumption that must be um, taken into account if we lived on a globe. So again, you, you know, they're taking the assumption to prove the assumption. And I'm telling you, these things have all been set up, guys. I mean, Eratosthenes, these guys, they're complete forgeries. It's all fraud. I mean, I'm just telling you guys that in a way that uh, if you want to look it up and look into it, uh, I'm still digging to the bottom of it. I don't want to really release it all, but all that stuff is a joke. The Library of Alexandria, the burning... I mean, basically, everything that we know from the B.C. era is, is has, has been lost to history. Those books have been lost. All we have is rewrites by Ptolemy and the people after him, and they're just attributing everything to these same people to kind of build them up, but they're all just things that we they found out in probably 15, 1600. Um, so I don't even describe to that anymore. There's no way that Eratosthenes in, I don't remember where it says, 600 BC, um, measured the circumference of the Earth. There's no way. It's absolutely, uh, first of all, he wouldn't have known how far 50 miles was away. They didn't even have the compass. So how does he even know what's north, what's south, what's east, what's west? It's all just crap. It's all fed to us, and we, we work up this mental thing like we believe it. And when you really break it down, take it down to its bare elements, I mean, if you just think about it, they didn't come up with the fact of zero being where Jesus was born until, you know, fairly recently, say, what, 500 years ago. So how does somebody write a book in 400 AD? What did they write the date was? What was the date to them? Well, if you go back and look, all those books are gone. There's no way to see them. They've been rewritten and rewritten and rewritten so that somebody will say, well, this book was written in 408. How do you know that was the date then? So yeah, it's just... Say, I, I hate to interrupt you there, Matt. You've actually brought up a topic that I'm hoping that we can touch on um, shortly because I think that deserves its own discussion. But just to put a line underneath this question of the mathematics that our friends like Reds and others throw it, particularly at you and then more recently at us here in the Bolo Skeptic Roundtable, I want to ask you a quick question, journalism, and then we'll throw to... Wakey, wakey, who's next on the question list? And Jaren, the question for you is this. Tell me what, what is more absurd, the notion that some guy in 500 BC measured the diameter of the Earth or the notion that 200 years ago some guy with heavy balls hanging from the roof of his shed worked out the mass of the Earth? <laughs> well, I think they're both absurd. But They're, bo um, they're, they're both absurd. They're both absurd. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, the entire thing is the pompousness of those guys to come across with this math, and that's what I meant by they, they, they carry it around like it's a, um, a prize. And what we need to realize is that it's basically cheating. How hard is it to, to be a, a debater when you are coming on the behalf of science and science is built upon truths? So you get to walk around talking about things with your own set of proofs. It's, a, it's an absolute... and. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you guys know my whole story, but I was an atheist for a year, and I'm one who doesn't just settle for things. I wanted to learn all the things about it. I wanted to learn everything about evolution, and I saw it flat out, what everybody was doing. I saw the tricks. I knew exactly what it was. I saw it for the religion it is, and I said, this is just an excuse for stupid people to walk around and feel smart. That's all it is. Yeah, I get where you're coming from. Well, I tell you what, I know that this format can be uh, frustrating and I've been so um, pleased by the patience that all the panel members have shown so far. If you're just joining us late, this is, of course, the final episode for Season 1. 
and we've been joined by my regular co-panelist, Matrix Decode from Spain, David Weiss from New York, and also all of the guests, most of the guests from the first season we've got with us, D Murphy 25 allegedly Dave, Mark Sargent of Flat Earth Clues from Episode 3, Jurinism from, from Episode 6, Morgoth from Episode 8, Stars of Souls was with us from Episode 9, he's had to leave, we thank him for his time, and Wakey Wakey of WakeyWakey.com. Now Mark, you've been very patient there, I know that you've got a question you want to throw out there, so the floor is yours. Thanks John. I uh, just want to quickly say Jerrynism is my sister's favourite flat earther, so maybe I can put in a good word for you there, Jerrynism, one day. Uh, on the subject of maths, I mean, we talk about maths and numbers till the cows come home, but no one's really talking about golden fee and golden spiral. Uh, I'm sure everyone in this sort of room is aware of this number, this 1.618 irrational number that shows infinity. It's a number that's in... Uh, seashells, it's in our fingers, it's in our face, it's in nature, it's in animals, it's in insects. And ball earthers and mainstream science stay well away from this golden fee, golden spiral. And a lot of flat earthers seem to stay away from this number as well. And I personally feel this is some sort of key, a, a divine code from our creator or our creators. I would, I would just want to know I would like to know the thoughts of maybe Mark Sargent on this number and maybe uh, Durf, what, what these two guys have got to say about the golden fee number. You want to jump in? <laughs> I'll jump in. Um, okay. That's a, the, there's a lot to answer in that. And, uh, you know, for those that aren't familiar with sacred geometry, the flower of life um, um, and the... the um, the Fibonacci sequence and the golden mean, they're everything in the universe, and I say universe with quotation marks because I don't even know what that is. I could say change that word to dome, um, is based on this flower pattern, on these uh, Fibonacci sequences. And um, I, there's not enough time to explain it all, but I think it's very significant. Why flat earthers are, le are are avoiding it, I haven't noticed that. I would need to um, understand what what you're seeing before I could really answer that. Mark? Well, for me, the, the, the short version is this. God, God is a programmer, and I have no doubt. And uh, there's as far as intelligent design goes, there's levels of complexity here that we won't probably ever see you know not not in the state we're in now uh, but yeah the the golden the golden ratio and and everything you're talking about there every, every time I see something like that I just my mind is blown because it's like you, you think because we always equate uh, the divine or you know you want to call it the builders the creators and we try to 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 relate to them in human terms and more, you know, more often than not, we discover something huge, like what you're saying there, and and it and it's there's so many levels above us that it just screams design and structure, and you know, it's why I'm doing what I'm doing now. Yeah, yeah, I agree that this is a like a divine creation code, and then that could lead us on to without getting into sort of pseudo new age, it could lead us on to crop circles. Because we can all talk about hard maths and rationale till the cows come home, but there are things in our reality, like this golden mean spiral and things like crop circles, that maybe we have to look at differently on a flat earth model. I mean, what are these crop circles, these geometric crop circles? Are they sort of the human elite sort of playing with us with some sort of energy technology, or is this also something from higher divine creator beings? What are your thoughts on this, Durf and Mark, or anyone else really? Um, well, I'll make a quick I'll, comment. I'll, oh. go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead Darren. I was just going to make a quick comment that I just discovered recently because Bob, my co-host on my show, has a an account with a uh, crop circle site and sent me the password and said, here, go check out these crop circles. And I went there and it lists an archives and beautiful archive, beautiful web page. It went back to 1968 or something. And so I said, oh, I'll start at the beginning and work my way up. Well, when you go to 1968, 1970, 1975, the crop circles look like shit. They look like kindergartners did them. So it was easy for me to dismiss them from that point. There's no other reason. I mean, are aliens or is God having, you know, moving in 
tandem with us as far as his ability to create complex crop circles. So that's just my opinion, but I thought it was a big clue to me that if you go back in time, there's not a decent crop circle uh, until the 80s, and even then, they're nothing compared to what we see today. I'd so think that they're very much proved, aren't they? Because the, the stalks, in, in man-made sort of hoax ones, the stalks are, are broken. In the sort of uh, the real ones, should we say, the stalks are just bent, and after the crop circle's sort of gone, a month later, these crops grow higher than the others, and also people can photograph orbs. But I don't really want to get into a, a crop circle debate on whether they're real or not just more a sort of view on it from a flat earth. Right. It's a, there's some sort of energy that's doing this, intelligent energy, whether it's the elite, whether it's God. I don't know the answer to that. My, uh, I, I had the same observation as you, Jaron, that um, they're, they've gotten better over time, so maybe it's a human thing and they've just gotten better at it. But it's also there was less cameras. There was less ways to find them. There was you know, probably the same amount of hoaxing. There are hoax crop circles. Um, and that, you know, it's just more, you know, now there's drones out there taking pictures of these things, getting them up before they're mowed down, before they, you know, before they're harvested. Um, and it, it's amazing. Just without turning this into a crop circle thing, on my website, deepinsidetherabbithole.com, there is a crop circle page for anyone that just knows the mainstream media's uh, version of it. I encourage you to go there. There's a documentary. There's photos. There's, some of them are the most incredible things ever, and they do relate to this flat Earth topic. So check yeah, it out I there, agree. and uh, it's it's a, an amazing, amazing phenomenon. I think I think I suppose what I'm trying to say is a lot of the flat Earthers, there's a lot of rational, rigid, intelligent minds, which is great, but there's still other things we need to look at that maybe things like myth, the the golden fee spiral crop circles, I just feel the percentage of people looking at these things is, is like... You still there? I think we lost him. Yeah, we, we lost to, him. To, that, that, to, to, his point, to his point, though, um, everything, if, if, not if, but when this thing finally gets revealed, uh, everything from the conspiracy world, every mystery that we've ever looked at before and, and made assumptions on will have to be revisited for for this. Uh, you know, there's very few that I, I've mentioned that uh, that would be discounted, you know, because, because of the flat earth. But a, a lot of them would be changed. They'd become a lot more intimate and become a lot more integral to, to the part of, to whatever this is. Right. It it's it's all related. Um, all of these things are related. Um, when we get into our final topic, which is where is this going, I have some comments, but I'll, I'll wait until John throws to that. John? Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, we're, we're already three hours into the show, and my hope is to wrap it up within four hours. It's already 1.30 in the morning here. I'm loving the chat. This show has gone so much better than I expected. It's never easy with the roundtable format, so thanks again to the panel for your patience, and thanks to listeners for your patience. We've got almost 200 people in the live chat. I am trying to write down your comments and questions as they come, but it's not easy to try and host and uh, check the live chat as well. But so far, all is going well. There's a couple more topics I was hoping we could touch on. And Jeronism, you kind of jumped the gun, but I'm glad that you did. I wanted to ask the panel or anybody who wants to ask. Now, this isn't going to be a, a roundtable one by one. This is just anyone with thoughts to add. Feel free to, to jump in there. But Jeronism, since you brought it up, I'll put this question to you. How much of history can we actually trust at this point? Because the more I look into the heliocentric Copernican model, the more obvious it becomes to me that some of the names and figures that we've been given to look up to, uh, they, they might have been entirely fabricated names and figures. And even yeah, I mean, people... You, know, <laughs> you probably don't want to talk to me about it because the deeper I go, the more I find that... Uh, and yeah, granted, it could be uh, you know people who are just saying that these people are fake so that you go down the wrong path. But on the other hand, we know what uh, proof looks like, and if you dig in the right directions, um, I mean, from everything, everything from Mozart to being completely fabricated, um, or not completely, but nowhere near the amount of works that he supposedly done. And you see behind every door, you've got the Jesuits, you've got the Freemasons. Um, it's just kind of obvious. So how much, how much of history? Um, I mean, myself, I wouldn't trust anything before 1600, and that is sounds crazy. But on the same end, um, I mean, just the fact that they taught us all Christopher Columbus, and you know, I've said it in my 
my videos the last couple times that uh, uh, we clearly know that that is not true. He did not discover America. There were people living here, and uh, there was maps that had America on them from before his time period, um, and just everything. When you look at it, it's all a concocted fabrication. And then when you look at the school books, and we see, well, what's in there? Science, the globe, evolution. Well, it kind of becomes evident that they would have done this on a mass scale. It wouldn't be just, well, let's leave history alone and just change science. Uh, they basically, and I'm sure you've heard the, the saying, that the, uh, the winners of, of, of the wars or the winners at the time, they write history. And so history is nothing more than um, people who are defeating other people, writing kind of stories about them, stories for them. So I don't think there's a lot of stuff we can trust uh, at all. I don't well, know if you guys are seeing the same thing, but... Well, journalism, let me put it like this. And yeah, I've been following your shows, and I think you've been touching on some really good things. And one of them is this idea that how much can we trust of history? You say that the winners of wars write the history. I'm starting to question how much we even know about the wars. And it's my hope that if this episode, for argument's sake, it gets 5,000 viewers, right? I know for a fact that most of the viewers, they watch YouTube videos, they listen to these podcasts, but they don't actually do any of their own research. They feel like they don't have enough time or they don't feel confident enough to do their own thinking. Or I'm not sure what their excuses are, but they don't actually really want to do the digging. My hope is that by bringing this topic up, the people who listen to this kind of show because they're interested in ideas, they're interested in, in, in different areas that they might do their own research, I'm hoping more people are going to start doing more research into what do we really know about history. And I'm not just talking 400 years ago. I'm talking a lot more recently than that, and I don't want to say too much tonight other than I hope that more people will start to really investigate what it is they think they know. Take away what you've been shown by TV because you know TV is lying, and take away what you know from school because school was telling you that you live on a spinning ball, and you don't actually have that much history now. Are you willing to spend the time to go and find out what you can piece together for yourself? I hope so because I've been doing that, and it's a fascinating exercise, and the more of us doing it, the closer and the quicker we'll get to the truth. And I want to throw one to you there, Mark Sargent of Flat Earth Clues. A lot of your work is based on the notion that there were nuclear tests um, done that might have touched the, the top of the dome. Are you open-minded to the possibility that maybe we've been lied to about atomic weapons in the first place? Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I've gotten emails about that since week one where people have said, well, you know, are, are the, any of the atomic tests, you know, true at all? And, you know, is it possible that we were fabricating the entire uh, nuclear program for, uh, you know, for fear's sake, for power's sake? Yeah, I, I'm open to it, sure. Um, but I, I do still firmly believe that at the very least we were sending rockets up with very powerful explosives to try to map the sky and that we did it for four years. And, you know, you can't make up an Operation Fishbowl you know that's just, you know, as far as what what they were at least doing with the Russians, but yeah, I'm absolutely open to it. Because I've been doing a bit of digging, and again, I don't want to say too much until I've got this bedded down. But I am hoping more people look into this. If it's the case that Werner von Braun was the leader of the NASA project, and if it's true that he was taken from Germany under Operation Paperclip, and he led the investigations into the V1 and V2 rockets, and if it's true that those rockets were sent in the hundreds maybe even the thousands, to bomb London during World War II, then the moment that you start to unravel NASA, then you have to pay attention to Werner von Braun, then you have to pay attention to the V1 and V2 programs, then you have to pay attention to the Nazi administration of Germany, then you have to pay attention to World War II and the belligerent nations that we're told in textbooks today, were at World War, winner takes all. I'm sure that the listeners who are thinking for themselves can see where I'm going with this. It's my hope that people won't get stuck on Flat Earth Research. They'll understand that this is just another level of uh, programming that you have to go through. But for me, it doesn't end here. And so I was hoping to get some of the thoughts of the panel. How much time have they spent now that they've come to understand the ball Earth model is utter nonsense, it's doctrine, it's dogma, it's ridiculous. Now that they've understood that, have they gone further with their research? I see in the side chat that, uh, allegedly, Dave from episode one has uh, something he wants to chime in with here. Dave, have you spent much time looking further into the other lies of history? Uh, yes, absolutely. In fact, um, I've come to the conclusion you can't trust anything in history. Um, I, I titled my um, my video "The Biggest Lie of All," but while I was uh, you know researching it, I found an even bigger lie, and that lie is history. Um, 
I mean, the, one of the first things I found was uh, that um, King James of the King James Bible was a black man. And then I f that led me on to finding out that um, the whole of royalty in the UK um, was, was, were, were black. And, um, you know, if, if that fact can be hidden from me for, you know, from, for my 52 years of my life, then, you know, they can, they can hide anything. Um, uh, Jerem I think it was Jeronism, or was it Mark, who said uh, about Christopher Columbus. Um, I probably didn't know that uh, the original Native American Indians spoke Hebrew. <laughs> you know, uh, the, these, are, these are facts that we, we, we aren't told. Um, and if we were, we'd have a completely different view of our world. So I think that, um, you know, the flat earth is very significant. I mean, it's easy for you, anyone, to look at the idea of the flat earth and say, well, what does it matter to me? You know, and from a, you know, day-to-day -day physical, you know, nuts and bolts um, perspective, it has nothing, you know, it has no significance. But what it does have is a, is a kind of spiritual and psychological um, significance. You know, it... Uh, it makes you realise a hell of a lot of things, and I think we're going to go into this later. But, but, um, but yeah, it's it's made me look at um, essentially every aspect of my life and uh, and life on this plane. Um, and uh, yeah, you're right. It's not a destination. You know, this is this is just merely yeah, one stop. Sorry, I was saying certainly not. It's not a destination because it's uh, there's something new behind every door. And it really does, though, show you um, the sinisterness of the people behind the whole thing because there is a hate for other humans and there's a hate for God and there's a hate for the land and there's a hate for uh, prosperity and the futures of others. And that's where you really see it all. Once you see the point of everything, uh, really will change your perspective and... I know that personally. I know some people aren't ready for it. You know, I've got to now think about, you know, do I really want to release these videos? And unfortunately, with just the way I am, I'm going to release them regardless because um, I don't know if some of you guys saw uh, the backlash I got for just posting the Stonehenge video, and mm -hmm. people seem to misunderstand where I was coming from. But to me, uh, and and I even done more research since then to see God was I not looking in the right areas? And the more I researched, the more I even saw the thing was constantly changed for the last 200 years, mm. um, in and out, people in and out from uh, moving stones and changing, they were all dropped over and other people attacked it and people graffitied it and then they rebuilt it and they brought in cranes, but we're all just sat in school and taught, oh, these 5,000-year-old nomads drag these stones. Well, that's a great story, but when just the, the things that have happened in the last 200 years, it, it just makes the whole thing bunk to me. And, yeah, you can keep digging from there. And I think that I do agree that it's kind of hard to find some of the stuff. But on the other hand, they have to give you numbers. That's a good thing to go by. They have to give you, like, the amount of people on a boat or something like that. And you can do your own mathematics. I mean, I'll just give you an interesting one. And I'm not saying that I've studied this enough to know of it as a hoax. But if you look at the numbers of African-American slaves, they say were brought over from Africa to America, they say 20 million in three, uh, 300 years. Well, then they tell you the whole story, and it all seems very true. How, could, how would you deny that? We know there was slaves. There was the Civil War, etc., right? But then when you start to dig into that, do the math on how many people could fit in a boat at the time and how long the trip took. The trips took four months to and back. So you're talking eight months to get from Africa to America and back, and only 400 people fit on the boat. So divide that out by 300 years, and you'll start to see how it's absolutely impossible. You would have to have 2,500 ships going in a year to and from Africa. It, it wouldn't happen. It, it's impossible. And you should, by doing this kind of research, you'll be able to really tear some things down. Now, by that, you're not saying, oh, there was never slaves. Obviously, there were slaves. But it will tell you where they've completely inflated numbers. Uh, same thing with the Holocaust or the Holo hoax. Uh, just go look at where, where were the incinerators? How many people does, can you incinerate in a day? How many incinerators were there? 
how many people did they say died and how many could have possibly died or I'm sorry how many could have possibly been burned if they burned constantly the entire time of the World War II and you'll get a number significantly different than you would expect so it's just kinda you can really dig in and see that the answers are there Oh, absolutely um, and it's yeah. not just wartime figures that people should be re-looking at and asking questions about. It's other aspects of what we've been taught from a young age, and we might have time to get into a big discussion about it tonight, but I'll give one example that my listeners have heard me talk about before. Dinosaurs. We were all trained from a young age to believe that millions of years ago there were these lizards that roamed the earth. Absolutely. And <laughs> all sizes. But the moment that you look into, well, where's the actual evidence for this? And it turns out that the holotype bones, that is, the actual bones from which they extrapolate to try and tell you that they've got skeletons, for many of these uh, so-called species of dinosaurs, not only do they not have one full dinosaur, they've only got a few vertebrae and some teeth, maybe a part of a skull. And yet from that, they've somehow extrapolated this big giant beast, and not just one of them, but an entire species of them. And then you ask, well, when did they start finding these bones? In the mid-1800s. in the mid you know, and, and this is one of many, and I think a lot of people, they are, I don't want to say that, that it's, it's too many people, but I think a lot of people, they're getting very wound up in the flat earth stuff, which is fascinating. That's why we're all here doing this show right now. But like uh, Dave Murphy said earlier, this isn't the destination. This is just one stop along the way. In the live chat, Robo Spirit says that, Jono, those of us without a, a channel, we're still doing research. Yeah, Robo, I'm sure you are. There are plenty who are. My point is is more towards the general people who, and they're, they're out there. We, we all know they're out there. They, they watch the videos that are put out there. They'll listen to these podcasts, and it's all very fun and entertaining. But they're not then saying, wow, I was lied to about the spinning ball. Time to, re to go and revisit everything. And it's my hope that people listening to us right now, they'll think, well, if I have been lied to about the ball, maybe it is worth going and revisiting all these other things I believed. I believed in the ball because of school and TV. What other things did school and TV get me to believe? And for me, I, I'm doing this because I'm a baller skeptic, but I'm now skeptical of everything. You tell me that you did something, and if I think there's a motive for you to lie, I'll think, well, where's your evidence? Do you know what I mean? And there's big motives for the lies. Just about everything that we've been told about history, somebody has money to make from it. So I'm now saying, where's your evidence? And time and no. time again, it turns out they don't have any. And, and wakey, wakey, one of the things that you said on episode 10 really stayed with me. It was some people out there, they get that the Earth's not a ball, but it doesn't change their lives. So do they really get it? And I'm paraphrasing what you said, but, and I'll let you expand on this. Your, your words, what they meant to me was, if you actually get what's going on here, that we're not on the ball they're telling us, if you really get it, that doesn't just change the way that you see the world, it changes the way that you see your life. Yeah, totally. I mean, flat Earth's really the umbrella conspiracy. It's the umbrella over all the others. I've done years of research into Zionism, Auschwitz, secret societies, government paedophile cults, uh, mystic and occult history. So you can't really understand history fully without studying occult history. But a big one I've looked at deeply that is related to Flat Earth, I feel, is the transhuman agenda. Because this doesn't really work too well without athe atheism. Because not many are going to merge their organic vessels with technology if one lives in a divine, intelligent design. But if one's on a random ball, comes from a monkey, has a random galaxy to explore with a billion other Earths, then people are more likely to merge with this technology. So the ball Earth lie lends itself for other lies to flourish. And with, the, with enough belief, the lie be can, can become the truth. That's the thing. Yeah, certainly. And this, this is true, this is a great point. There are a lot of flat earthers that come home from work, have their dinner, and watch a bit of flat earth YouTube as like almost like a hobby. But there's some really serious issues going on and need to be looked at seriously. And it's not just flat earth. There are loads of other lies underneath this umbrella. Well, before I started in uh, flat earth, I'd spent, um, I've spent the last eight years sort of delving into, uh, you know, other lies. Um, you know, I went I went 60 60 days without eating. Um, I know I absolutely know the bo human body does not need food. Um, I I've healed myself of all things just with um, yeah, probably not the right forum to talk about it, but with human urine. You know, um, I don't need uh, any medical uh, establishment. Yeah, 
Um, yeah. I've, I've just finished a, a set of experiments, um, which I'm going to carry on actually, with sleep deprivation. I went seven days, or two lots of seven days, without sleep. Um, all these ideas that we've been fed about um, us and our world, um, you know, when you actually Lies. start looking at them and experimenting with them, you find they all fall flat. My favorite yeah, is, yeah. my favorite is, don't look at the sun, especially during an eclipse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it's really good for you and gives you pure prana, and you might see what's going on. <laughs> The, the, the lie is, it's not just where we are, it's what we are. I mean, the Earth Flat are so much a big lie about where we are, but they've lied through the television and pharmaceutical companies about what we are, about our physiology, about our consciousness, about how powerful we are. And as we know, the sort of atheistic flat Earth model takes away a lot of our self-power and makes us very insignificant and puny and very monkey-like. You're quite right. We're... Uh we're amazing creatures, and um, you know we've been we've fallen for a, for a whole set of lies. And I, I lump um, evolution, the Big Bang theory, along with the uh, the round Earth theory. If you combine those, it makes us insignificant little microbes on an insignificant world in the middle of nowhere. So um, you're right, Mark. It's um, you know it's it's that feeling, that idea that's in the back of our heads that allows us to uh, go along with this this whole program. Not only that, you know, we'll merge ourselves with technology, but it gives justification for the genetic modification of our world and, and you know, the destruction of our world and destruction of, you know, so-called inferior people and whatever. Yeah, there's some, there's some dark people on this planet. It's not negative. It's, it's an objective truth. There are people who like destruction. There are people who like dystopia. And there are people who like to control other humans. The good thing about flat Earth is people wake up to it, and then they sort of a lot of them do wake up to other things quite quickly, and it's that's why the movement's gaining so much pace because it, it is the umbrella conspiracy really. It's it's <coughs> not just it's not just uh, dark people. Um, there is a there is a non-physical aspect to this. Um, when I was doing the you know yeah for the sure movement, um, you know you're looking at the pyramid of control. And uh, you know you got up to you know the high elites, you know the queens and the council of thirteen and so on. But there was always someone missing. There was a, there was somebody at the top of the pyramid, and uh, I think it's that character that's behind all this. Yeah, and if people listening are new to this sort of how high does it go, I, I would suggest to research things like the archons from Gnostic thought and maybe evocation magic and ritual because. You know, these things do occur. We could look at things like uh, Princess Diana's ex- death or uh, a little girl, Madeleine McCann. We could look at things like this. These, these are ritualistic killings, 100%. And that's, that's exactly what Freemasonry and Mithracism uh, stole and what they know and why they uh, want to promote the atheistic agenda because those who understand the power that they have create the world. So, uh, for instance, a lot of these guys get to the moon, and by promoting that truth, according to them, uh, it can become truth. Yep, because, um, yeah, because making moon physical kills all the mystique and the, all the lunar goddesses. They, they die because it becomes a physical rock that you can get to. So there's a lot of absolutely terror being killed with this sort of materialistic dystopia that they're trying to create, this sort of techno-fascist dystopia. But people are running towards this technical dystopia. They love it. I mean, people are glued to their smartphones. But we could go on to other subjects for hours, couldn't we, guys? You know? but yeah, but I see this flat earth as being the umbrella. It's the umbrella conspiracy, really. You know, every as you said, history is all lies, you know, maybe there's some exceptions in there, um, and everything is the opposite pretty much of what we were told. You know, there's people out there that are screaming this is PSYOP. That's all they have. It's all proof they have is that they can spell PSYOP, and that it's a distraction from all these other things, but everything is the opposite. Those other things are a distraction from flat Earth. Flat Earth is the grand deception in my mind. 
because as I believe it's Mark that gave out the analogy, and I've used it a hundred times, that you can put a tiger in a cage, he's not happy, but you put him in a safari park, as long as it's big enough, he hits the fence, he turns around, and he goes back into the woods and he's happy. But you put humans and say, hey, you're in a dome, there's no controlling us, and it's all about control. It's all about our energy. Um, um, Wakey Wakey mentioned the, the Archons. That's all about stealing our energy, but we have the, the law of free will or the law of consent. Um, I don't know where it comes from. It's a God-given power that we have, and they trick us into giving that up. So if right. you, Yeah, yeah. They There's a Michael Hayer hangs right out in the open. Yep. Right. Like they, right. They have the right to sell us anything they want, and that's their free will. But have we bought the lie? So they, they, they can put whatever they want on TV, whatever they want on the street, whatever they want in the shops. It's their free will to do that. But it's our free will to choose what we put our energy into. But unfortunately, everyone's putting their free will into buying this sort of, these lies and this nonsense. Right. And if you look at you know, the, the um, karma of killing, you know, I, I believe that you're not allowed to kill because it's going to come back and get you. And they say, you know, like George Bush is like the biggest mass murderer. No, George Bush didn't kill anybody. He told other people to kill people, and they did it. And that's their right. free will. You know, it was he so, told to get up on stage and pretend as though he's the one that makes those decisions, and he went along with his job as a puppet actor, David. I, Exactly. No, that, that's what I'm saying. I'm just saying that the, the people that know what's going on aren't breaking the rules. They're just twisting the information, implanting us. You know, the human mind is very easily implantable with um, thoughts that make you think they're your own thoughts. So, you know, we all have the ability um, to, to not cooperate and not become part of this and become part of the solution. And I really believe that waking people up to the flat earth, you know, I guess this can lead into our, uh, our, our, our where is this going. I really believe that waking up to the flat earth is a possible key to our freedom. You know, Dave, I'll just tell you, it absolutely up. is. It absolutely yeah. is because I can just tell you when I put out my first video, I was scared because of the backlash I would get and what people would say because of what we were all taught and how stupid people are to believe that the earth is flat. And right away, the amount of emails I got from people who said, I was atheist, and you have brought me back to, to the infinite. You have brought me back to the divine. It was the only reason I kept going is because all I did was put out a video speaking a few truths, challenging what we were taught, and all of a sudden people were able to say, I went from being an atheist to now you know, finding God, that's that's astronomical to me. That's it's unbelievable. Let, because, let me make one more oh, go yeah. ahead. No, I was just gonna say it's life changing and if, if if it's that easy and first you know, not for everybody obviously, but all all we need to do is start getting human consciousness going in the right direction again and it will take off by itself. I mean, that's why we all discovered this at the same time. Yeah, this is why exactly. it's come out in January, February. Right, exactly. You mentioned that you were an atheist for a year. I've been an atheist my entire life. I never bought into the religion, the whole God thing. I was scientism, you know, indoctrinated and, and everything. And discovering that this flat earth thing is, you know, I don't necessarily, I, I have no agenda here other than discovering the truth, but it has made me realize there is a creator. We are the center of the universe. We are way more important than they've been trying to tell us that we're not. And that's not the reason I got into Flat Earth. I had no idea that it would lead me down that path. But you know, now I hear you know, people talking and they bring up religious things, and now I, tu I sit and I tune in and I focus on what they're saying. As before, as soon as any radio show brought up religion, I, I turn right. the channel, go to another podcast. Now I'm listening. there's elements and truth in everything, right? I mean, right. Exactly. Every, every, and this is the things that you wish human beings would wake up to is, you know, I get told every day by numerous emails that I need to find Jesus quickly to save my soul. And I just wish people understand, understood that, look at this entire world, they, everybody worships the same God. Right. Yeah, well, I'll person, tell you what, guys. We're, not just um, one book. <laughs> yeah. This makes right. a perfect segue into the final topic for the evening. That wraps up the general discussion. There's one more topic, and I want to go back to the roundtable format if you guys are comfortable with that. This is a topic that I wanted to talk about, but I thought it was best to leave it till the end of the show. So we will go through again the chronological order of the guests. 
take a minute or two to give your your opinion on this. Then we can have a quick general chat, and then it'll be time to wrap up the show. And the topic is uh, a simple one: Where do you see all of this going? Obviously, um, most of you guys on the panel have been uploading videos relatively recently. You all got onto the show in the first place because you're putting out good work on YouTube. Since you guys started, more people are out there now every day making videos about this. The intro music that we played at the start today, uh, The Earth is Flat by, I've got his name here, Kevin Hobby. He released it a couple of days ago. No doubt he was inspired by one of you guys on the panel tonight. So this is growing quickly. What I want to know from each of you guys, and then we can have a general chat about it, is where do you see this, I call it the Neo Flat Earth Movement. Where do you see it going over the next few months, over the next couple of years? And you can tie it into where you think it came from in the first place, if you like. I just want to get your general thoughts. And like I said, this will be our final uh, major topic for the evening. Thank you guys so much for sticking around for as long as you have. It's 2 o'clock in the morning here, so I need to wrap it up soon. So in chronological order, on episode one we had with us, uh, Murphy 25 allegedly. Dave, where do you see all of this going over the next few months or years? Well, I really don't think there's uh, any accident that um, the flat earth um, idea just suddenly resurfaced. Um, I've been looking at this for nearly a year now and uh, when I first started looking at it uh, there were a few videos, a few badly made videos to be honest, um, talking about experiments. Um, I hadn't come across uh, Eric Dubay stuff but there were um, guys talking about experiments and things that didn't really make any sense. So f it seems for years, for maybe 150 years this topic has just been crawling along, you know, just just staying in the background and all of a sudden it's literally exploded. I don't think there's any accident. You know, we're, we're living in a satanic world right now and uh, I think I like the the metaphor um, that we see in some, some films where you have the gods sitting around playing chess with, with human characters. Um, and this is this is I think where we are. We're um, we're uh, pawns in a in a in a game uh, that's been waged on a different dimension. And um, not only are we the pieces, but we're also the prize. And um, I think that the flat Earth came along to wake people up. And and what they're what we're supposed to wake up to um, in the conspiracy movement. Um, we've been sort of looking at how um, there's this agenda to uh, push aliens and UFOs, you know, make them very, very real. Um, and ultimately towards this idea that uh, these aliens are going to turn up one day and, well, you know, they're either going to be saviors or they're going to be our destroyers, one of the two. I think uh, they're now sort of moving it towards saviors. But, um, but the point is... Now that the flat earth is out there and is, is expanding exponentially, the more people who see this, the more people will suddenly turn around and, and say, well, gosh, I didn't know there was anything to this. Um, now, if, if they try and bring in this, uh, this whole alien agenda, you know, they start putting mile-wide my, my, mile ships in the sky, well, anybody who's actually um, you know, seen the flat earth, what it is, isn't going to buy it. You know, so we're not going to go along with uh, whatever agenda comes out of it. So that's that's what I think the uh, the flat Earth is going to do. It's just going to give us that piece of knowledge that we, we when we see supposed aliens, well, we know that they're not real because there's no such thing as space. Mm, very well put, Mark Sargent of Flat Earth Clues. Um, you're a very humble guy. It's one of the reasons why people like you. So you might not like me saying this, but your Flat Earth Clues did help really bolster the awareness of this on YouTube and in the so-called truth community. You weren't the first guy to start doing this work, you haven't claimed that you were, but your Flat Earth Clues did resonate with people in a way that some of the work prior to you hadn't done. You are one of the leading figures of the Neo Flat Earth movement. Where do you see this thing going over the next few months or years? Um, I think it's, I think it, there's something bigger on the horizon than, than just this. I think the Flat Earth is, is part of a bigger awakening. If you want to call it a natural process, of the system, the the fact that you know maybe we're we were destined maybe to all become part of this hundredth monkey effect, and then once that happens, you know the the builder creator whoever you want to call it, then they show up and and you know decisions are made then. 
will the authority get involved? Uh, you know, the people that rule this planet from the ground? Yeah, maybe. You know, is it a setup for something else? You know, like uh, what was just being mentioned about, you know, perhaps a staged alien event? Yeah, maybe. Maybe a, a fake Planet X thing. Um, hard to say. I think it's going to get, I, I know it's getting nothing but bigger because every day something surprises me. Um, I th in fact, I think the mainstream is going to be late to the game. You know, they can drag their feet all they want, but this is happening, the, the movement that's happening now is behind the scenes uh, to where if, if the mainstream even bothers to cover it when it, you know, when it finally, when this thing finally breaks, they'll be, you know, too little too late if, if they're going to try to stop it in any way, shape, or form. So it's it's just very very exciting. Again, you know the fact that Forbes magazine briefly touched on it uh, a month ago. The fact that what Joe Joe Rogan brings it up in his show on his own uh, two days ago. Uh, it's just uh, uh, amazing to see. So yeah, nothing but bigger and better. And I don't think it's going to take years. I think it's going to be a lot quicker. And uh, at the pace it's going, I, I think it's I think this thing's going to break open soon. And you think this is all organic? Uh, it's hard to. Say. I think it could go either way. Uh, I think it. I think it. Fe it feels organic right now, but I think it could possibly be turned. The authority, whatever is the, you, you know, what I mean by the authority, the the ruling governments of the world, the powers that be, they're not stopping this. They're not even seeming really to put up much of a fight, and that kind of yeah, of course, you know, they put out the the picture of the blue marble recently, but then they announce when they're putting it up there. Oh yeah, by the way, we haven't done this in 43 years. Why why do you say that during the article? Why not just put it, make it low key? Oh yeah, by the way, let's just slip in a, a blue marble picture. Why have the White House tweet it? So I think it could be turned either way. I think whatever's going to happen, the 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 precipice. That we're on, I think it could turn good or bad. I'm, I'm just hoping that the, the people of this world uh, will, will choose to, you know, wake up, you know, sooner rather than later, and, and turn it into something wonderful and maybe a new golden age. Hmm, fair enough. We'll go to Jeronism. Um, I know that you do speak about this a lot on your show, and most of our listeners are your listeners as well, so this won't be new to them. But as a, a concise summary, where do you personally see all of this heading the next few months or years? Well, I hope personally that people wake up and see that you know everything that we were taught and told and indoctrinated with, everything we've been convinced of, has all been placed in front of us for a reason. And I think that together we can do anything. And I was raised Catholic and was taught that the meek inherit the earth. And and now to look back at that, you know what a sham to tell people, yeah, let people control you you be down lowly and poor, and in the end, you will be on top. Well, no, that's what the elite would tell you, so that you sit in your house and do your job and let them run the earth. Well, even though I was taught that my goal was to acquire the kingdom of God and to get to heaven, I now realize that the truth is right in front of me, that we can bring the kingdom of God here. We can bring heaven to earth with nothing more than intention. And that's why the elite is scared, because... Right now, they have people's minds, so they're able to get away with pretty much whatever they want, but they're afraid that if it ever was just a group of right-minded people, because we have the uh, benefit of human consciousness on our side. Um, I don't think these guys on the other side have any bone of creativity in their body. I think they steal our energies. I think they steal um, a ton from us, and if we just used it for the right reasons, they'd be gone tomorrow. I always say this earth gives us everything we need to, right now with just fruits and vegetables and grains and, and the water and uh, if we didn't have Nestle bottling every bit of water out of California you know everybody drinks free fresh water we don't have to go to the store to buy groceries plant an apple tree you grow apples grab the seeds plant more apple trees we still got we got kids dying in Africa still 30,000 a day you know, and these are the things that I wish that I know I can't change on my own, but I think that collectively, um, that that's what this is going to lead to. It may not be a year away; it may be ten years away. But uh, as long as we keep the momentum going forward, I don't think it can be stopped. Jeronism, you and I, and all the other people on this panel, we all um, cross paths on YouTube. And once upon a time, YouTube was a hub of so-called truthers who spoke about how 
Sandy Hook and Boston bombings were hoax events, 9-11 was an inside job, all this kind of stuff. And they, about this time, 12 months ago, a number of them were doing a show where they were considered by many to be the so-called leaders of the so-called truth movement. They used to get hundreds of live listeners. Now their shows get dozens if they're lucky. People have either moved on from all of this altogether or they've moved on to the flat earth. There's now 180 people watching this live right now. Your show gets incredible numbers of live listeners. And, and Mark, I'm not sure if your platform allows for live listeners, but if it did, I'm sure you'd get in the hundreds as well. And I only bring these numbers up as a comparison for where attention is on YouTube right now. Journalism, do you think that this has all happened organically or, or do you think that this was put here for, for whatever reason for all of us to latch onto? No, I believe more in human consciousness. I think that uh, cosmic dissonance is correct. I think that um, that there is embedded in in the human and in every animal is uh, we're all connected. So I think it's just a matter of uh, when one person thinks about it. I look at God a lot different than a lot of other people do, and it, it, my version of God is that it's split into each and every one of us. And if you were to do that and battle an adversary, let's just say Satan, and you were to have this little competition where I'm going to split myself in a million bits and go against you, well, you would have to put a protection mechanism to make sure that you could never lose. And that protection mechanism would be the human consciousness, being that even if you were down to 7 billion against 1, you still had a chance because that one just needs to think for itself and turn into two and turn into three, turn into four, turn into ten. Now the problem is now there's a lot of people sleeping and that are living the life of watching Fox News and um, you know arguing over whatever the elite want them to argue over. And uh, So I think that there is a, a lot to overcome, but I have faith that the, uh, the human mind is, is – absolutely unbelievable and that's why I've lost faith in science because science can't tell me what's beautiful they can't tell me what's ugly they can't tell me what's that conscience inside me they think that my mind is in my head or in my brain uh, these things science has a has a limit and they crossed the limit and went into theology teaching their evolution which is nothing more than a religion and and I see the hoax I see where they where they're going with it and I'm gonna do my part in knocking them on their fat ass. Well, they can give you pretty pictures of Nebula and Neptune and Mars and all these other CGI paintings. They think they They're real pretty. <laughs> a lot of people buy into it. It's, uh, it's kind of sad when you work it out. Morgyle, you're the one person on this panel who's had a chance to have a so-called debate with a so-called expert. We don't have really time to dwell on that uh, too much, unfortunately, but I bring that up because if people are suggesting that this has all been put here to help people, um, that, that the people who are in charge of the show want us talking about this, then I would say to them, with the Art Bell um, instance that, that involved you, were, were they not told to give you a chance to win the debate? I mean, what, if, if this is something that they want people waking up to, then why do they try and stop the alien, the 50-year-old alien believer Art Bell audience from waking up to it? Can you see where I'm going with this? Do you think this is all organic, and where do you see it all going? Yeah, uh, I see what you're saying, and um, I, I think that the, the verifiable truth is sort of an entity of itself, and um, once you show somebody there is, you know, there are, there are lies involved with the uh, heliocentric model, and there is a lot of truth around the, um, the different flat earth models, then it really is the truth prevails, and, you know, I should mention real quick that I agree with, I believe it was Wakey Wakey's sister, uh, Jaronism is my favorite flat earther too. Um, and I should mention that I've indeed watched and, and rather enjoyed each and every one of these panel members' work, and uh, all of them have very valid points to make, and uh, to me, any theory apart from the one involving the Earth being a globe is certainly okay in my book at this point. Um, I think it's great that we're able to have this conversation in a uh, you know open format and have our honest disagreements in a relatively relaxed and, and balanced environment. Um, and, you know, again, the verifiable truth is what led me to this firm belief, whether the topic was allowed into the discussion, you know, by the control grid for some reason or not. I, I think that's sort of irrelevant. Um, you know, I don't profess, profess to know if that's the case, but it certainly could be twisted into an extremely divisive topic, which is not the direction we should allow it to go. 
Um, I can tell you that, else the effort is doomed to failure. Um, uh, on another point that was brought up, this whole deception in involving the very shape and nature of our world um, is the very fundamental deception which all the other mass media programming devices hinge upon. Um, global warming, scarcity in terms of fuel or resources, taxing the flatulence of cows are all examples of how the globe model, which is false and only exists in people's mind, puts us in a state that is conducive to all these other Hegelian mechanisms that are built into the widely accepted model. Um, if you look at the phenomenon, changing topics again, of the Phoenix Lights in Arizona, I believe in the 1990s, which involved miles wide, you know, space spacecraft, quote unquote, being witnessed by tens of thousands of people, um, you know, either results in one or another theories, either it's aliens or quote little G gods, or um, the other theory being the whole thing is a government psyop. Um, but it, it it does seem that the media has been pushing the necessary pre-programming needed to get the reactions that they desire from such a you know, phenomenon, whether it's a false flag operation or not, involving mile-wide ships. So I wouldn't be surprised to see a phenomenon like this materialize. Um, one of the most unfounded and nonsensical arguments that is purported by the globularists is the one that goes, you know, people have known for 500 years that the world is a ball, and all of modern science has arrived at that conclusion in full agreement with the theorem. Um, which, again, the whole theorem is based on mathematical documentation of our measurable reality. So, of course, the math is going to add up. Um, the transhuman agenda is certain, certainly a topic that we need to see for what it is, which is an obsession with or total perversion of uh, natural entities. Um, this perversion and obsession with technology to the point of wanting to merge with it is becoming more and more mainstream if, if only subliminally in the minds of the masses. Um, winners of wars indeed write history and the losers of wars have no voice at all. Um, thankfully we do have a voice and this is a war of theorem, one of which is founded in reality, one of which is not. Um, in such a debate, the truth will always win every single time. The problem is each individual person needs to be deprogrammed on an individual basis in most cases. And we really need to consider them as victims in this, still very much plugged into the control grid which exists in their understanding of what is theori theoretically possible or not. And they are subservient to this system of control, which they're oblivious to and rather enjoy in many cases. Um, the atomic tests definitely need further scrutiny, as um, we have a lot of deception and propaganda surrounding that whole nuclear phenomenon. And the fact that we now understand that the Russians in the U.S. were far more in cahoots than they'll ever admit. Uh, propaganda is far more easily distributed with opposing forces at work, or so the theory goes. Um, mathematics is a human expression to explain the observations to be found in nature. Um, mathematical equations must be correct by their very nature or definition. And so the fact that they actually represent the observations that we find in nature is no mystery, and we cannot take mathematical assumptions as anything but that assumptions, which will always prove a false point if the assumption happens to be incorrect or misguided in terms of its alignment with reality. Um, for example, if we had 12 fingers, then we might have a much different version of mathematics than we have now, which would also be true mathematically, but quite different from the mathematics that, you know, that are based on the decimal system. So. You can argue that the intelligent designer built us with 10 fingers in accordance of the, you know, 10 being the best logical way to express, express mathematics in our world. Um, so the mathematical expression or perfect ratios found in nature are also, you know, pleasing to the eye or aesthetically enjoyable. Uh, essentially, it, it sort of loses its mystery in a sense when you define it in mathematical terms, but it also sort of increases in its mystery if you study the mathematics. Uh, Morgan, well, 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 I hate to interrupt you there, mate. We're um, we're just coming towards the end of the show, and I'm just trying to get people's thoughts on where they see all of this going. Do you want to do you want to just uh, concisely summarize your thoughts on where this so-called flat Earth movement, the people sure. using the word movement now, where do you see this going, really quickly? 
Yeah, and I'm sorry. I should have prefaced that with stop me if I go too long. I know we're running short on time, so I apologize. And, uh, yeah, I, I think, again, what, what I would rather point out is where I would rather not see it go, which is uh, turned into an element that um, divides us. I think that we should see it as more of a, uh, you know, a unifying fact that we can all sort of agree that the science that we've all sort of been forced to swallow hook, line, and sinker our entire lives is indeed false. Yep. Uh all right, thanks for that. Wakey, wakey. I know we discussed this um, briefly when you were on episode 10, but um, just, yeah. just basically, uh, you know, you've played a large role in the, uh, the large awakening to all of this, and obviously you spend a lot of your time not just talking about the flat earth aspects, but about so many other things you've been doing your blog since, what, 2007, 2008, so you've covered a lot of aspects of what I call the life system. Where do you see the so-called flat earth movement going, and you know, you said on episode 10 you, you're open-minded, 40-60 or 60-40 that it's um, planted or it's organic, this, this flat earth thing that swept the alternative media. Yeah. Uh, is that still a fair summation of where you're sitting or what are your thoughts? Um, well, I see it's very multi-layered where it's heading. I see it heading into the mainstream, whether that be through interviews, through a popular figure coming on board or through someone in the community sort of elevating into that sort of mainstream spokesman role or through word of mouth a bit like 9-11 sort of everyone got wind after five years about 9-11 through sort of word of mouth so I see flat earth just growing exponentially more people like down pubs normal sort of mainstream people talking about it it's gonna grow it's unstoppable I also see it heading in the community is going to unite a little bit more I mean today's a great example of that got a lot of people with a lot of subscribers a lot of audience and we're all talking and we've all got a lot of respect for each other and that's a really really good sign and hopefully the listeners will feed off that as well and when there's some disagreements we can sort of say well we're all on the all on the same team I think it's also going to start uncovering more that's hidden so the flat earth community instead of constantly fighting ballers it's going to be more people looking into things like the stars, how Venus and Mercury have phases, geology, archaeology, the rewriting of history, uh, cataclysm cycles, all these sort of like niche little, niche little specialities within the flat earth. But where, where are we sort of heading? I mean, um, is it organic or is it psyop? The other day I sort of said I was 40% it could be a psyop. But I'm probably like 30% now, and I'm starting to think it's more maybe like some sort of divine trigger almost. Maybe, maybe it's the case that spiritual light, the dark in higher planes, are starting to rebalance or shift somehow. This links into some of my other work. I, I certainly think we're getting close to something big, some sort of change, a sort of possible tipping point event. Uh, it does look, if we look around, that this capitalistic system's about to wobble. I mean, they're, they're lying through their nose. It's like they don't care. The stock markets are starting to really wobble. It's just, it's all becoming very unsustainable. The collective consciousness is, is screaming for change. Even the person who's asleep in his sort of nine to five factory job, inside he's screaming for change. We're screaming for change. So in the collective consciousness, this needs a gasket. This needs a gasket to blow out of. And that will probably be in the shape of a physical event whether that's man-made or a natural sort of event or an economy crash, we don't know. But I, I think by 2021, I think we're going to be living in possibly quite a different world. So I'm going to keep my eyes also on things like the markets, the skies, and you know, keeping, keeping my energy into creating a good livable off-grid space because I think we're in a very important time in our history. And I think flat earth is, is, is a part of that. It's a bit like the arrowhead. So there's a lot of other things linked. It's not just flat earth. There's where humanity is going. What does the collective consciousness want? What's happening around in the geopolitical arena? I think things are coming to a head, you know, because we could go one way to a sort of transhumanist dystopia or this system, this toxic system could crash and we could start again. And it would be hard, but we could create new sprouts of a sort of, No, we haven't lost him again, have we? No, he finished. Oh, did he? Oh, excellent. Sorry. Oh, that's excellent. Thanks, Wakey Wakey. Um, we've got a couple oh, more no, panelists. <laughs> I guess right, he wasn't so what finished. What we're going to do is oh, I want to get Matrix and David Weiss's opinions on this, and that will be time for final thoughts. So thanks again to everyone for your patience. I do appreciate it. And I think those are important topics to cover.
especially because so many people are now putting so much time into watching these videos and and uh, thinking about these things and you know it's always worth thinking to ourselves well where where does it all go from here and, and why did it get here in the first place so we'll go first to you there Matrix uh, live from Spain your thoughts on where this is all headed over the next few months and, and years if you're thinking that far ahead and um, how much you think it's organic and how much you think they want us thinking about this stuff. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I, I think it's uh, what Mark was saying there about, you know, the uni unifying people, bringing people together, I think that's really important. I mean, this flat earth subject, it really connects a lot of dots, it puzzles people as well. And, and, and it changes everything. And I think as we move forward, there will be better flat earth models presented, they will be refined, uh, the proofs will keep piling up. It's, this subject is not going away, it's growing exponentially. Uh, it's, uh, to me, there's it's a, it's a spiritual aspect to all of this, a, a reawakening for so many people. We will discover more and more as people begin to question things. That it's like there's a race to free people's minds. There's definitely an information war that's been going on all this time, and we're seeing it. Uh, you know, um, I expect to see more propaganda from NASA. More space exploration stories. Uh, you know, recently NASA has released a, on Twitter a, a tweet asking which image of, is, is the real photo of Jupiter's moon Europa, and they use they present nine images, and eight of them are, are the bottom are the bottoms of frying pans, and uh, you know you're supposed to choose which one, and it's really like the, is this a photo or a painting uh, question, and I think they're mocking those that are still asleep and are unaware of the fakery. Um, you know, uh, it's really an as this whole subject and uh, debate and question. You know, the globe Earth model. It seems to be about mind control, the fundamental aspects of how they deceive people and manipulate people. And uh, you know, it's this whole flat Earth subject is freeing people's minds. It's uh, getting us to question everything, and you know, freeing us from the matrix, the system of control. It changes our perception, our priorities how we see the world around us and our existence and, and purpose. Um, so for, for me and uh, all of us, I'm sure it's a very exciting time and uh, I think the guests and others are doing very important work. Um, we have proofs already that the earth is flat and I look forward to all the new discoveries that uh, can and will be made in the coming weeks, months and years. Very well said, and oh, that's the way. David, off you go. <laughs> I was going to jump in. Um, yeah, as I said earlier, that um, I, I believe I don't believe that there is a psyop at all. I think this is the last thing they want people focusing on. You know, they ignored it long enough, and now it's gaining momentum, and they're doing everything they can to stop it because you know, waking up to the flat Earth is the key to our freedom. You know, once people wake up to the flat Earth they're going to realize that everything else in history is a lie and they're going to stop co cooperating, take our power back, and we can solve all the world's problems. Uh, world hunger, you know, the energy, you know, free flow of information, technology, all of that can be released from the stranglehold it has by the archons or whoever is controlling uh, what is going on here. And uh, I really believe that this is our, our key to our freedom. And do you believe this is all organic, David? I believe it started out organic. This is the last thing that they want. You know, they might be interjecting some crap in there. You know, NASA is feverishly releasing, you know, um, stuff which kind of dovetails into, you know, the claims that we're making. And now they're releasing other photos and all sorts of stuff to try to discredit this, but I do believe it. it is basically organic. Is it possible, David, and, and I, we can't expand too much on this, but just quickly, can I get your thoughts on this? Is it possible that once upon a time people started working out that there were media hoaxes going on, the internet was just at the point where people could talk about this and make videos about this, so then the powers that be or the authorities we're happy for people to focus on one or two blatantly fake events like Sandy Hook and Boston bombings. Then people started looking at NASA fakery in greater detail, realized there was more fakery going on. Then people started to work out that maybe the heliocentric Copernican model is nonsense. But this is just one more layer and they're actually quite happy for people to stay at the level of flat earth because that's fringe enough that they won't really wake up most people around them. Most people simply will not 
give up the spinning ball model. And so long as people stay at this level, they don't go down the next level or the next two or three levels of just how far the rabbit hole goes. Is it possible they're more than happy for us to stay here focused on flat Earth so long as we don't go any further? David, what say you? Yeah, I mean, if, if we just keep doing what we're doing and don't do anything else, yeah, that's great. You know, they, 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 they're all the 9-11 truthers out there. You know, what are they doing? They're doing nothing. You know, the world still thinks 9-11 was real, which is just ridiculous. Um, I think, though, that this is a truth that we can feel in our bones and see with our eyes and sense with all of our senses and that if we could just break that programming, you know, it is, it, it, I'm finding that it is far easier to wake someone up to the flat earth than it is to uh, 9-11 Sandy Hook or Boston. For some reason, I, the, the emotional impact of that um, is harder to break. But once people wake up to this, this event, I believe it will change the world. And I believe it is cascading. Uh, Mark Sargent, you know, and others have commented that, you know, it's really picking up momentum. And uh, I have high hopes that the light will crush the dark. Well, the, the reason I bring this up, and I'll just put this out there as a rhetorical question, I'll let the listeners think about it. Is it possible, okay, so they want us to, be, there are people out there who want us to believe that the, the flat earth thing has gotten big because the, um, the authorities want to distract us from other hoaxes which are minuscule in their scale, such as the media hoaxes of Boston and, and San Diego. I'm not saying that those hoaxes are unimportant, of course they're important, but they're nothing compared to the hoax that is involved in the Copernican spinning ball model, right? Then there are people who say, actually, the authorities are putting it out there because they want us to wake up to this. They want to have a big awakening. They've got something in store. Then I say, okay, is it possible that they want people waking up to this? Because if people get stuck on this, they're not going to wake up to the other things that are being hidden. Is it possible that the great awakening that people are imagining, that awakening is only possible if people go further than the flat earth. And I put that out there as something for the listeners to think about. And I've already touched on a few things so far in this episode. Other people on the panel have as well. This isn't the end of the line. There's, there's more to it. And it's my personal hope that anyone who's been listening to us for the, to us for the past 12 weeks, they'll realize that, yes, this has been fun for 12 weeks. And I've personally really enjoyed it. And I've gained so much from it. And I've had the pleasure of talking to so many cool people. They've got me to think about new things. And hopefully listeners have got something from it as well. But if you get stuck on flat earth, then I put to you that you might as well be stuck on Boston, you might as well be stuck on Sandy Hook, you might as well be stuck on Bill O'Reilly and, and Hannity and Combs and, and all of that. There's more to it and it's my hope that more people will realize that. And I think it is possible that they want us focused on flat earth, not because we'll have a big awakening, but because it'll stop us from the big awakening. And with that said, it is time to move on to our final thoughts for the episode. It's 2.30 here in the morning and I need to get going. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the panel in chronological order. Make sure you stick around if you can for the after show. We will have an after show. Uh, I will save a bit later just to chat with you guys off the air, our little debriefing after session. So give us your final thoughts. Check yourself on mute and hopefully you can stick around for the after show. In chronological order, we've been joined by allegedly Dave, Mark Sargent, Jeronism, Morgal, Stars of Souls already left us, Wakey Wakey. So I'll give each of you guys a chance for a minute or two just to give your final thoughts on, on the show tonight, the season that we've had so far, any plugs you want to give for your own website or your own channels, and any final thoughts you want to leave listeners with? Try not to go over time because we've already got to four hours. I think that's uh, that's plenty for one evening. So in a minute or two, just take your time for your final thoughts. We'll start with you there, allegedly, Dave. Well, first off, I'm I'm really proud to uh, be part of this. Um, you know, the uh, people on this panel have been um, are really amazing people. I'm a bit disappointed that Jeronism was here. I was actually hoping for Missa to be on here because uh, the song they put together was really really good. Anyway. <laughs> She's still in bed, actually. Where I'm thinking of heading as soon as I can. <laughs> well, uh, my final thoughts are that, um, yeah, as I said, there was no accident that uh, this flat Earth business appeared when it did. It is part of this awakening. It's a huge part of this awakening, um, and uh, and the world isn't going to be the same after it, it hits the the tipping point. And I'm I'm pretty sure it's going to hit the tipping point. Um, you know, um, very soon. Um, so um, that being said, I think again, it's it's just one part of uh, of a larger journey, and uh, um, th these are exciting times. This is these are the times that the whole of history has been pointing to and saying, yeah, this is when it's all going to happen, and uh, and we're lucky enough to be here. This is an amazing game, and I'm I'm really happy to be playing it. That's all I've got to say. 
Thank you so much, allegedly. Uh, you were our first guest on the show and you helped kick the whole thing off. I can't thank you enough for your time. Please stick around and we'll chat after the show. Mark Sargent of Flat Earth Clues, I've already said openly on this show and others that your, uh, your Flat Earth Clues, especially the first five or six, really got me thinking in a different way. I can't thank you enough. People can accuse myself or yourself or anyone else of whatever they like, but ultimately if you're helping people to think in different ways, then I think you're doing something special and I want to thank you personally for that and for being there. Uh, a guest on the show during the season and a guest tonight. Any final thoughts you want to leave the listeners with? Um, yeah, it'll be real quick. Uh, pretty much everything allegedly just said is it was perfect. Uh, yeah, very excited to be part of, you know, I, I'm humbled to be a part of whatever this is that's happening this year in 2015 and, and why it's happening. It still remains a mystery. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for, for letting me part of this panel. I, I'm, I'm honored. And uh, a quick plug, you know, uh, the, just go, if you want to see everything that I do, uh, it's enclosedworld.com, easy enough to find. And uh, just so you guys know, I compiled Flat Earth Clues number 12. I know it's been a long time in the making, um, but that is compiled now, and it's probably going to go up this afternoon. And all it really covers is its response to a lot of people, the, the haters that have come out and said, oh, hey, you know, we don't, you know, the, you, there's no way we could be fooled by this. There's nothing, you could not fool the entire world uh, into where they, you know, where they think they live. I go, no, we can be fooled in just about anything, and that's what Clue 12 is about. It's called Realize, so enjoy. I'm looking forward to that. On episode four, we were joined by Rory Cooper from My Perspective. He wasn't able to make it tonight, but that was a terrific show. He speaks really well. He thinks about things in a way that, that helped me to think, and uh, I want to thank him for joining us on episode four. On episode five, we were joined by Eric Dubay again. I bought his book for 10 bucks. He put things in a way that helped me to see that the lie system really is a lie system, and he wasn't able to join us tonight, but I'd like to thank him for joining us on episode five. He re-uploaded to his channel over 30,000 views to date, our most successful episode in terms of, of listenership, so thank you, Eric, and thanks for the work that you do. Episode six, we were joined by Jeronism. Uh, thanks again for joining us tonight, mate. Any final thoughts you want to leave listeners with? And make sure you put in a plug for the show that you do with Misa. Okay, yeah, thanks for uh, for having me. I really love being included with uh, some of these guys I think are awesome. That uh, They've given me a lot of inspiration and ideas, and uh, I love the collaboration. I think I've learned so much just from this. I have so many notes written down. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, we uh, we actually are starting a new show also. We're doing... Right now we do Monday nights at 6 o'clock. Uh, we call it Globe Busters. It's my wife and I, um, and we finally got her a new microphone yesterday, so Nick should be a <laughs> better quality. Um, and then Bob Zana, Dude60 uh, is a co-host, and then also TJ Chambers. So we do that show on Monday nights at 6 o'clock. And we'd always talked about doing something like this, and because of the success last week or this past Monday, um, when we went together as a group and watched the ISS live, uh, we're going to start doing that on Tuesdays at 6 o'clock. Um, same channel. Uh, it's just going to be an hour or two of just going to ISS live. This way it's random um, and just watching it as a group and laughing. And that's it. I try and uh, expose NASA because I think that uh, if people were to ever find out that space isn't what they were taught, uh, there's going to be enough people around the world dying to know what is the truth, that I think that that's one of the quickest ways we can get there. So thanks for having me, guys, and, and everybody. I, I've watched all your stuff, and everybody's awesome, and um, appreciate you guys doing what's right. Thank you so much. Well, on Episode 7, we were joined by Stinky Cash. He wasn't able to join us again for tonight's show. He's a young guy who's put up some videos of him basically getting stuck into the, the lie system that he's taught by his university. So for those who aren't aware, I'll put a link underneath this video in the info box for you to check him out. But Stinky, if you're listening, and thanks again for joining us on Episode 7. Then on Episode 8, we were joined by John the Morgyle. Uh, over to you, my friend. Any plugs that you'd like to make for your channel? Any final thoughts you want to leave the listeners with? Sure. Thank you, guys. And, yeah, it's, it's definitely been an honor to, uh, to be in the present company. You guys are all great. Um, I think really this entire thing is the beginning point of awakening for many people. Um, I do agree that we cannot stop here. Uh, however, all of all of the various deceptions that have been pushed by the mechanisms of modern culture, culture politics, 
uh, falls almost exclusively on the shoulders of the globe model, if not always directly, certainly indirectly in, in many cases. Um, we need to go beyond the true structure and nature of our world. However, we can't forget the importance of this topic, um, nor can we forget how each person needs to be sort of individually explained the truth. Um, so we, we can't let it slip into the historical trend of years gone by, um, as this particular truth will need to be professed on an individual lever, uh, level to every professor and active scientific mind for the entire future. Um, until the professors of the world are simply compelled to see this evidence and consider it rationally. Excellent. Thank you for that, Morgov. Nice and concise. That's the way we like it coming towards the end of the show. Stars Our Souls on Episode 9 joined us for the first half of tonight's show. We want to thank him for that and we wish him well in his future endeavours. Wakey Wakey, Mark of WakeyWakey.com. Mate, thank you so much for your patience tonight. A couple of weeks ago we had some really... Um, frustrating technical difficulties with you, but you pushed through all of that. It meant a lot to me, and I want to give you a chance now to say any final thoughts for the first season of the Baller Skeptic Roundtable. Yeah, thanks, thanks, John, for a really good show, a really good format. Uh, really glad to be here, especially with these other guys. Uh, I'd like to say to listeners to be strong, to stand up for your beliefs, and that it's not your job to have to wake others up. Uh, maybe some other people are not supposed to wake up to certain truths, and it's not your job to prop these people up. So maybe it's better to concentrate on your own awakening and your own journey because you've been gifted this flat earth knowledge for a reason. So use this knowledge because times are probably going to change soon. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Well, that wraps up the final thoughts for the panelists who joined us during the season. Again, guys, if you can, please stick around for the after show, but if you can't, Thank you so much once again for your time. Now it's time to turn to my co-panelists for the season. We'll start off with uh, Matrix, Decode, the live from Spain via London. Matrix has been a big season. I've enjoyed it. I know that you have as well. Take a minute or two now to give the listeners your final thoughts for not just tonight's show but the season in general and anything that you might want to plug uh, to do with your own channel and things you've got planned for the future. Yeah, thanks, John. Well, I mean, it's been a fantastic show. I mean, and, a, and an awesome season. And I'm, I'm so grateful to have been a part of it and you know, being able to chat with the guests. The, I mean, the guests have been, you know, uh, it's hard to put into words. I mean, they, they take us all over the flat earth and, uh, you know, thoroughly, you know, get, got us to question the globe earth model and touched on all kinds of subjects, you know, uh, spiritual uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's just been totally awesome. Um, so I want to put a big thank out, thank you out to all the guests. I mean, it's been marvellous. And uh, John, you've done a, a fantastic job hosting the show. Uh, and, and Dave, you know, deep inside the rabbit hole, awesome man. Great sense of humour. And it's just, it's just been a wonderful show. So I just want to say thank you to you all and for the support that everyone's been giving us as well. So. Terrifically well said. And over to David Weiss of Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole. I made a joke at your expense a couple of hours ago. I don't think it came across the right way. I didn't mean any offence. I want to give you a chance now to uh, give your final thoughts, like I said, not just for tonight's show but for the whole season and share with the listeners, if you're willing to, any projects that are in the pipeline for the future. Um, yeah, this was really great. Um, you know, We had our initial conversation. I said, let's do this show. With your um, anal retentiveness and your obsessive compulsive disorder, you've made it a fabulous show with uh, really banging out the details uh, much better than I could have done. So I appreciate that, John. Um, everyone, check out the Ball Earth Skeptic Facebook page. You can, you know, it's a good way to wake up people. If you start talking to people, I'm like, what do you mean? Tell them to subscribe to the page. I kind of take everyone's work and I try to post the best videos there. So it's a good wake up source and. Uh, Check out my podcast, Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole. It's all linked up on uh, – everything's linked up on my website, deepinsidetherabbithole.com. And there's a uh, – is the Earth a Ball page, which has some of the absolute best videos on it to help wake, wake up your friends. Terrific stuff. Well, I'm going to get my final thoughts out as quick as I can, and I'm going to wrap the show up. So please bear with me here. First of all, I've got to thank once again, one more time, the entire panel on tonight's show. We were joined by – Allegedly, Dave D. Murphy, 25, Mark Sargent of Flat Earth Clues, Geronism, the Morgyle, Stars Our Souls was with us at the start, 
and of course Mark of Wakey Wakey. Thanks to all of you guys and also thanks to the others who couldn't join us tonight. Episode uh, 4 was My Perspective, Rory Cooper over there in South Africa. Episode 5, Eric Dubay there in Thailand. And episode 7, Stinky Cash. Thank you guys all so much. The, the feedback that I got on every single episode was terrific. There was not one single guest where I got overwhelmingly bad feedback. In fact, apart from maybe one or two comments throughout the entire season, the vast majority of feedback about the guests was terrific. And I it wouldn't have been a show without you guys. So thank you guys for, for booking in ahead the way that you did and for turning up when you said that you would and for just being who you are. I, I can't thank you enough as a person. And, and I'll probably keep on saying thanks until I shut myself up. I need to move on to... Uh, some more thanks that I have to give, obviously, to all of the listeners. Um, a, a number of them have been with us right from, from episode one through to today. They've been loyal listeners, and I want to thank them. Those of us who've joined us late, you know, thank you guys as well. These episodes are up there now on YouTube. A number of people have re-uploaded them. Some people have ripped them to MP3 and uploaded them to their own channel. So who knows when this will be listened to. So I'm not just thanking the live listeners, of which we've had almost 200 at, at certain points tonight and, and the 100 or so that we've had over the last few weeks. I'm, I'm thanking anyone who's taken the time to listen to this, especially if you're new to this. It might seem absurd at first, but as I read out from that quote of Newton, he said that gravity was absurd. So, you know, for someone to take the time to listen to us, to myself, to David, to Matrix throughout the season and all of our guests, you know, it really means a lot to me. So thanks to all the listeners and especially thanks to those of you who are doing your own research. Now, I know that sometimes I get a bit frustrated at, at some of the people who just watch videos or listen to podcasts and don't actually do any reading or any you know, critical thinking. I probably am a bit too frustrated at times, but uh, it means a lot to me when people do the opposite. When they're doing their own thinking, they get in touch with me. They send me a message on Skype or on YouTube, and they say, hey, John, did you hear about this? I was reading about this, and I thought about this. And when I can see people doing their own genuine thinking, their own synthetic, you know, trying to come up with their own ideas of how the world works and their own genuine research. It, it doesn't just help me, it helps them and I think it helps all of us. So I want to especially thank the listeners who are doing their own work and I also want to say sorry to the listeners who have been getting in touch with me lately. The last two or three weeks I've been overwhelmed by messages. I plan to respond to each and every one of you so please sit tight. Thank you for your patience. Now I have to say a big thanks to my two co-panelists. Uh, David Weiss, um, I didn't mean to offend you early in the show mate. You, this show wouldn't have happened without you and for people who aren't aware David has a certain positivity to him, not just on the air but off the air, and you need that. You know, sometimes Matrix and I can be a little bit dour or whatever. You know, David brings a positivity, and and that's what actually got all this show started. Matrix and I have been talking about the flat Earth thing now ever since, basically since Mark Sargent hit the scene. Matrix and I have been talking about it, and um, and we probably never would have actually gone very far with it other than our own discussions if David Weiss didn't jump on the on the Skype and on the YouTube and say, "Hey guys, let's make it a proper show." So, David, if it weren't for you, this show wouldn't have happened, and I. Don't know what the future holds for, for myself or for you or for Matrix, pardon me, or for or for any of this, but what I do know is the past 12 weeks, you were a big part of it, and so for that, I have to say a big thanks. And to you, Matrix, you first got in touch with me back on Sunday sessions all of those months ago. I'd never heard of you, we had a chat about the Flat Earth. At the time, all the other people on Sunday sessions thought that you and I were crazy. Well, who's crazy now, man? We've got 160 live listeners, we're killing it. Isn't it fantastic, man? I can't thank you enough, not just for what we've done on the air, but off the air. Some of the thoughts you've thrown at me, the things that you've suggested to me to look at. It's helped me a lot. And uh, as a personal thanks, man, I, I can't thank you enough. I, I can't keep saying that. It's, uh, it's time for me to wrap the show up. I want to leave the listeners with one final thought, and it's something that I've touched on already tonight. If you're just listening to me, if you're just listening to Matrix or Dave or any of the panelists, then I'm not really sure you're getting much out of this. What you need, in my opinion, to be doing is your own thinking. I've had people say to me, John, why don't you have a donate button on your channel? You know, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Guys, if you want to thank me, the only thing you need to do is to think for yourself. That's really all I got into this hoping to do was to give other people ideas to think about in the hope that one day they give me ideas to think about. So if you want to thank me, and you don't have to, but if you want to, please just go and do your own research. And that doesn't mean just watching YouTube videos. It means reading books. It means studying other fields. It means questioning everything you've ever been taught because if all those skepticism should teach you one thing, it's that you can't trust school and you can't trust the institutions, and you can't trust TV, and you basically can't trust any of the people you used to trust. So now it's up to you to go and work out what's actually real, and for me, that's what skepticism is all about. Time to wrap up the show. I'm going to leave you guys with Flat Earth Song. It's by Glenn Cardia in 1974, and it's a song that I played on my Sunday sessions for now. I'm going to play it again, and then I'm going to press stop broadcast, but um, live panel, stick around for the after show. To all the live listeners and to everyone else who I've forgotten, thanks. A uh, huge thanks to you as well. And you know what? Well, while I'm in a good mood, just quickly, 
last week we had with us three ball earthers on the show. Critical Unity, thank you for having the courage to stand up and try and defend the ball model. You were on a hiding to nothing from the start, but it took courage to do what you did. And to uh, Red's Rhetoric and um, Marai Zilla, I don't know who you guys are and um, I don't know what your motivations are, but I think that unless you're, you're working for an agency or you belong to a lodge or something, and I've got no proof that you do, then, then you're men just like me and I think we all have a, a common enemy now. Unless you work for that common enemy, then I wish you all the best and if I said anything in frustration last week that upset or offended you, then if I had my time again, I wouldn't. You know, we're all on something. I don't think it's a spinning ball and if you really do, then I shouldn't be uh, angry or mean towards you I, or nasty towards you. I, I should have compassion and sympathy for you because it, it simply means that you've been misled by a monster bigger than most of us can conceive of and um, and I, I want to say that I truly do, if you guys mean well the way that I think that I mean well then then I wish you well and thank you for coming on the show and, and, and trying to do your best and, and, and there's much more I can say than that. This is going to be the, the last song that we play for season one and who knows what the future holds. Good luck to everybody, good luck with the research and uh, thank you so much for listening to, to me talk about how the earth is not a ball. This is Glenn Cardia. 1974 with a song called Flat Earth. Hope you enjoy it and um, I'll see you all next